Hey, what's going on, everyone? Welcome back to On Point. This episode is actually a collaborative episode hosted by Guy from the Western Contours podcast who organized this episode with a bunch of other content creators from Chad Riker, from Backcountry Rookies, you know, Joe from Elk Bros, Jim from the Western Huntsman, um, you have Mike Batiste, and then you have one of um, Guy's buddies who's newer to archery, who's getting his feet wet with hunting. And uh, just everybody provides their own really cool uh, perspective and, and priorities when it comes to getting ready for season. And uh, Guy did a great job, knocked it out of the park, hosting this thing, wrangling all of us up and keeping us sort of on topic uh, the best he could. And he, he did a great job, and I had a great time on this podcast. And I hope that uh, shows as you guys listen to it. I appreciate uh, Guy for, for allowing me to even be a part of it. And I really hope that you guys go and visit each one of these guys' contents or websites and give them a listen, give them a follow, and just support some really good guys that really do care and want to provide good information for folks like you out there that are willing to learn and uh, basically just absorb whatever content they can. So outside of that, I appreciate you guys for listening, and I will see you at the end. All right, so I'll go through some quick introductions. I'm sure that uh, everybody knows me because uh, I'm the a-hole that reached out. We got Mr. Joe Gillia, Garrett Weaver, Chad Riker, Michael Batiste, Jim Huntsman. Jim, we still can't hear or see you. And then uh, Cesar Marino. Can you see? I got a visual on can, can, can you hear me at all? I can yep. hear you. Yep. I just, oh, yep. you okay, hear. now I see it. You know what? Let uh, me I try. Have, and... I have a visual. My scope is already on him. In the crosshairs, Jim. <laughs> I don't know why I'm not getting. Oh, there we go. There we go. Hey, Huntsman, you. that twenty bucks will be in the mail tomorrow. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> hey, you know what? We shop at the same hat store, there, Michael. Did you just figure out that's what the twenty bucks is in the mail tomorrow for? <laughs> oh, I you got, got the, you, got you. Got the easy I thought promo, it was because you were dressed. I know. I thought it was because you were dressed. Dude, no, you're not, you haven't it, seen them from it, the waist yeah. down. I got to pay the advertising, dude. If I could have found some flesh tone shorts, I guarantee I would have gone and stood up part way through this and shocked the shit out of me. Uh, well, maybe we'll, my, my, maybe my. we'll come up with a bet or something, and by the by the end of this thing, at least somebody will have their pants off around their ankles. Something we'll figure something oh, out. We'll, we'll tarnish <laughs> this. Late. We'll tarnish Definitely this hunting archery conversation for sure. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> hey, hey guy, I got I don't think you're I don't think you're using the SM7. Yes, I am. You sure? Yeah, I'm positive. I'm Scratch talking. Scratch it. You're not using it. Is it going through my computer? No. Either way, you still sound sexy. Doesn't uh, matter what it's there you go. Look, I like what he's talking still about. Sound good. <laughs> this guy went there from the minors to the majors in a heartbeat. I guess we know who the fuck up in this class is. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. I guess we'll have to ask you and Joe after you guys get done after we record. Then we'll really know who the suck up is. <laughs> <laughs> you guys hear me okay? Yes. <laughs> Okay, thanks. I, I keep switching around. I just barely got it. Once I heard their pants coming off, I was like, God, I got kids. I should use the same bit my ear. <laughs> you know what? If the email chain wasn't a precursor to this, this was going to be some level of shenanigans, man. Oh, God, dude. I was at work all day today, and all my my phone just kept blowing up, and I was like, uh, I know exactly what that's about. I can't say anything about it. I couldn't even ch- I, didn't, I didn't even trust you guys enough to check my uh, my email. <laughs> that's like that's a good choice thing. Kyle. You know, What's yeah. we resemble that remark, dude. I mean, that's. <laughs> <laughs> so, guys, let's kick this off. I've been recording since we've been doing all this S talking, so we will have some outtakes and there'll be no denying what was said prior to uh, us <laughs> kicking off the episode. <laughs> I appreciate you guys jumping on for this. Um, I'm going to just go through, man. I'm going to do it in alphabetical order to the best of my uh, small brains memory. But we got Mr. Michael Batiste. Um, I don't know, Mike, what are you batting, man? You you about a 98 percent or 97 percent or in the Elk Woods over the years, man. Um, yeah, I, that 96 to 98 range. So been been extremely blessed. So we're we're gonna title Mike Mister Home Run for this one, and then we got uh, my buddy Mister Kyle Davidson. He's the engineer. He's the brains behind this band of miscreants. We had to have at least one brain. Um, 
So Kyle, I don't know if it's enough. <laughs> a membrane. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so Kyle, give us a little bit, man. So uh, I am the owner of DCA Custom Arrows. Um, I specialize in making premium custom arrows. Uh, they're custom fit for your draw length, your bow IBO, your draw poundage, all that stuff. Uh, go through, run all the numbers, make sure that you have a, an arrow that's going to fly straight and through and fast and hit hard out of your bow. Um, on top of that, do uh, custom wraps. Uh, just happen to have some here. Uh, custom wraps uh, and make them look as good as they fly, man. Heck yeah. And they fly good and they pretty. I got some pretty raps too. Uh, yeah, Mr. Joe Gillia, Mr. Instinctive. If it ain't broke, I ain't fixing it. What's happening, no. man? Hey, how you doing tonight, man? You know how I yeah. am. <laughs> Same day, brother. Same thing. Here in New day. Mexico, uh, waiting on some snow to arrive, hoping to get more moisture like all you guys. Uh, Chad's down in Albuquerque, just a little ways down from me. And I think they've actually gotten more moisture than we have up in the hills. So we're waiting for that to happen. But, uh, you know, it's really cool to, you know, I had never met Garrett before. And so I'm excited to to do that. I, I've been watching Garrett going through uh, his workouts and stuff and all of these, you know, posting that stuff and been real proud of his work that he's been doing. So, uh, Garrett, it's real nice to meet you, man. Thank you. Yeah, that's yeah, I really appreciate that. Then we got Mr. <laughs> Jim Huntsman, Mr. Do It All. And I think Jim is probably, in, you know, and, and not just because Jim's a great guy, but Jim is very well-rounded um, in in terms of hunting and his approach to hunting. And I thought he would bring uh, a, a voice um, to this conversation. So, Jim, thanks, man. What's happening? Hey, buddy. Thanks for having me. I feel like uh, I'm out of my league with all these guys you got on here. Yeah, just wait right. till we start talking <laughs> <laughs> we'll really get in real fast buddy <laughs> um turn off the light hold on so give us a little bit jimbo yeah the pants are coming off and lights are coming, <laughs> like, pants are coming down the mood is set there <laughs> set the mood <laughs> Yeah, what did you asked me something, guy? I, didn't, I just I didn't said, quite hear I you. said just give give us <laughs> give us a little bit who you are, et cetera. Just real brief, oh, and then okay. we'll get into the whole. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm I'm Jim Huntsman. I'm the host of the the Western Huntsman podcast up here in North Idaho, and uh, I fail at hunting more often than <laughs> I'm successful. And uh, just glad to be here. Appreciate you having me. Absolutely, brother. And then yeah, we got my up. Oh, sorry, go Jim's ahead. And bagging guy, huh? Jim's and bagging man. Yeah, he may be, but I I love uh, I love when he <laughs> says that. And then we got uh, the rook, my buddy Caesar yeah. Marino. What's up, brother? How you guys doing? Uh, yeah, I mean, just to kind of introduce myself, I haven't really been doing uh, archery or hunting for very long. I've been doing archery for about five years now. I mean, I guess relative to y'all, you know what I mean? It uh, it's pretty pretty brand new. And then. Uh, this last year was my first year of serious hunting. I went on guy. I went with guy to Colorado for ten days, and uh, did some pig hunting and deer hunting over the summer. And I uh, hope to continue the trend. So, uh, but in any case, I've been doing archery for about five years. And my day job, I do audio for a uh, university here uh, in Southern California. So uh, that's why I kept telling guy about his mic. <laughs> a couple <laughs> quick notes. So, so this, this dude, this dude is an archer, like every sense of the word in archer technical pays attention to every aspect of his shot wants to keep learning. I mean, this dude can flip and shoot guys. And that's one of the reasons that I asked Caesar to be on is because his, the dude is very articulate. He is very methodical, um, but he will soak up information and take that information and bend it to fit him. And it's just, it's beauty to see a new archer, especially with the flood of information, grab it like that and make it their own. The dude is Garrett. You would enjoy shooting with Caesar. This, this dude can shoot like a son of a bitch. So get him up to hoodoo this year. If, we, if I could make that, I man, appreciate I appreciate that guy. 
Um, I always tell you that. What are you talking about? Um, but yeah, the dude can shoot. So, you know, and to get his perspective in this conversation, I felt was a big deal. So thanks for joining us. See, uh, Mr. You, Chad Andrew. Riker, um, backcountry rookie. I'm going to say this dude went from the minors to the majors. Um, in terms of, you know, stepping up to the plate and really diving into, you know, not just back country, hunt, back country hunting, but hunting in general and every aspect of it. And then opening the door to, I don't even know, do thousands and thousands of people that were looking to take the plunge. Um, so Chad brings a lot to the table in terms of, you know, taking all of this information that Garrett's putting out in. What's <laughs> <laughs> up, Chad? Welcome, man. Hey, man, appreciate that little intro. I like to think of myself as well-rounded also, but it's more in the physical conditioning sense than <laughs> anything to do with hunting. So, <laughs> uh, No, man, I appreciate you having me on. Hopefully, I bring something to this table. You guys are all incredible that are on the, the panel here, so we'll see. Yeah, I may just be moves. a fly on the wall back there. No, out, no way. Every, that's every, the there's a reason that I chose everyone that's on here. Um, there's an absolute reason from following. I pay attention to stuff. Uh, and then Mr. Garrett Weaver, man. And this is, you know, again, alphabetical order. So not to, uh, last, but least you or least, but last you one of those. Um, yeah, Mr. Weaver, what's up, buddy? Not much excited and, and humbled to be here among all of these guys. I've been see a lot of your guys' names. I, I follow a lot of you guys and, and it's just uh, to be invited onto this podcast is an honor, man. And I appreciate you for being kind of like the middle of the spider web, you know, connecting all of us. It's always nice to make new friends and stuff. And um, the interesting thing, I, when you said uh, Mike Batiste, you know, him being like 98% in the woods, that totally reminded me of me, except unsuccessful. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> we have something sort of in common, Mike, I guess. <laughs> you could be in the woods and you could be lost in the woods yeah. too. So I mean, yeah. I could, is that, is that like percentage of actually being in the woods or being yeah. successful? Cause, <laughs> but no, I, I'm excited for this conversation guys and, and everybody here. Thank you uh, for letting me be a part of it. So, heck yeah. Well, I appreciate y'all for doing it. So I'm going to kick it off, man. I wasn't sure how I was going to control this. Right. So I, I really want to have an open forum and I want to have some fun, but I do want to provide the listenership on my platform. And if you guys choose to use this, some valuable information. Right. And there's so much information out there. How do we begin to meander our way through and find those things and aspects that work for us? Right. And it's a trial and error thing, a lot of it. Um, but it, it can be it can be very, very confusing, you know, coming into it. So I just wanted to kind of hit on that stuff and, and show folks that, you know, hey, that you can do this no matter, you know, what you're where you're at in this process. Um, so I, I don't. I think I'm going to go through one by one and we'll just start picking apart. If somebody has something to comment on, by all means, let the guy finish and then comment. I don't care if you trash him a little bit. Um, that'll keep it fun. We can get a little bit long winded. I know, you know, Lord knows I can. Um, why is this thing doing this? This stupid email wants to pop up. Okay. Um, oh, I did it. Sorry, guys. All right. I'm going to just have to live with that until I can figured out. So I kind of want to start with, with some simple questions to kind of each and every one of you. So I'll start with you, uh, Mike, in terms of technology over the years, right? I mean, you've, you've been in the woods for a long, long time. Um, I mean, I remember a story, you probably the only guy on this panel that has had a condom within three centimeters of your lips. Um, <laughs> Why did I know you were going to go there? <laughs> <laughs> but what, what have you seen in terms of the tech advances over the years and how has that affected, I'm not going to say the game, but how has that affected your game? And has there, have you seen any hindrance from year to year in your game because of those tech advances? Yeah, I mean, the advancements in technology, you know, when I started shooting archery in 1985, it was a Fred Bear 45 pound takedown recurve. Um, then I graduated from that to my first compound and still shot fingers and instinctive and, you know, finally gave in to 
a site and then a release aid. And, you know, the advancements in technologies, I think, has really helped with accuracy. I mean, you know, you can you can find all kinds of videos nowadays where people are drilling targets at 100 and 120 yards with a bow. And it's just absolutely insane. But then on the flip side, too, you have a lot of people out there that all of a sudden it's I don't have a problem taking a 90 yard shot on an elk. And, and you know, I got into archery to see how close I could get. And, and, and I've had a lot of conversations where people are like, do you, do you realize how much skill it takes to execute a shot on an animal at that yardage? And I said, yeah, I do. Cause I practice long yardage all the time. Do you know how much skill it takes to get an elk at four yards with a call? And also on that shot, there's so many variables. And that's the part about archery is removing as many variables as possible to increase your chances of success and, and taking that harvest home with you. And so, you know, the advancement, it's, it, it's been a help, but it's also been a hindrance because on X, I, I mean, you know, being able to scout areas and know where you're at out there, but also too, on the flip side, now a little bit of the woodsmanship skills is lost a little bit because we're relying on technology. And, and so it's, it's a double-edged sword. It, it can help you go farther. It can help you find your way back. But on the flip side too, you lose some of those skills that some of the pioneers before us really, really had. So it's, it's, yeah, some of it I really, really like and others it's like, yeah, come on, seriously. Um, <laughs> hmm. So are we just going to come out with something that's going to run out and do the hunting for us and we can just sit in camp and, and go, okay, great. My tag's punched. So Mr. Jillia. Yes, sir. If it ain't broke, go kill with it. Right. So in, in, in kind of a opposition, versus most of us here right you've been hunting with the same setup the same bow the same method for 25 plus years yeah the bow the bow i cer- that i currently shoot is over 15 years old it's the Eesh. you know it's it's the reflex caribou made by hoyt you know it was the chuck adams bow and that's because i'm a finger shooter and i'm basically being manufactured into extinction right now it's really hard for me to find a bow over 40 inches uh at that that uh to shoot with fingers without having extreme finger pitch pinch so i i've i've stuck with what i have i mean if it wasn't for guys around me that were like drug pushers pushing these new things on me sometimes i'd still be shooting double x's man i mean i shot double x 75s and you know i i have shot wasp broadheads forever i mean i'd have to go on the internet to be able to find the old um camlock conicals for a long time and you know then they changed to the hammer got some chisels so some of that stuff changed a little bit But, you know, same bow for 15 years, and in the last 15 years, uh, I've been 100% in the last, you know, (laughs) about that. So, uh, I've been blessed. Uh, But I think it really, you know, when we talk about the technology of equipment, and when you talk about technology period and things like that, people can think that that's going to be a shortcut to success when actually it's not about. <laughs> so I've had all this pressure on me because my buddies are always telling me, you know, uh, you know, you've killed an elk every year for the last so many years. Right. And so you kind of go out there sometimes and I never thought about it before. I just thought that was something I was supposed to do. And then something I'm we're all front. supposed to do. We just <laughs> <don't>. <laughs> I'm doing it all wrong. I'm screwing it up every year. <laughs> so, and I'm out there one year and my bow blows up on me. Uh, so one thing you never do is travel on a four wheeler with your bow mounted on the front. Uh, so that mud can get inside <laughs> inside your axles, man, because it will roll that cable right off of it, man, and blew up on me. I always pull back before I go in. It blows up. So long story short, I come home. I tell my wife, well, I guess this is the one year I'm not going to get one. I said, I'm going to have to. And she goes, why? And I said, I'm going to have to get my other bow, you know, get it out there, get it set up, shoot it, and then get back up in the mountains. And she's like, I didn't know it was about the equipment. I thought it was about the hunter behind the equipment. And 
I mean, my wife smacks me in the face all the all time. The time. <laughs> she's like, she keeps it real, right? And and she's exactly right. You know, yeah, she's exactly right. So um, I haven't had to change anything. Uh, I it, it works. I, I actually think I have advantage with what I use in my setup. It doesn't take me very long. I don't have to think about a lot of things. I don't think I'm smart enough to shoot like you guys do, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mr. Davidson. Where's the line between archery, the tech, and, you know, that advancement from, yeah. the, from the engineer, right? Yep. Uh, I, I think, you know, I'm not as, uh, I'll say distinguished because I don't want to say old and offend everybody else that's already gone. <laughs> but, uh, I haven't been shooting as long. I'm kind of new to the game, but um, I do see the advancements. And I, I, I hear what you guys are saying. Um, it is kind of, you know, sugar coating it or something or trying to make it a little too easy or something like that. But I also think that, you know, the counterpoint to that is that bows are getting better. They're more reliable. Uh, they're better tuned. People are, are getting into that game and figuring out how it's done. So I think that it is helping people that don't have all the skill uh, to be able to get out there and be able to get the job done. But I, you know, it is a slippery slope, as they say, that you don't want to make it too easy so that somebody just gets, you know, uh, you know, carried to a place, they set them down, they shoot an elk and then they go home. That's not part of it. Um, I mean, like what I do is, uh, try to, I always tell people, you know, you can, you could go in a shop as you guys do and, uh, grab a handful of arrows and go back out and shoot and kill a lot of things with it. Uh, what I do with kind of all my, I'm kind of the counterpoint to everybody cause I am the technology guy, but, uh, you know, I, I stack the deck in the favor, uh, for that shot. So, uh, somebody that, that didn't have all the success or didn't wasn't able to tune their bow perfectly or something like that. Maybe I'm helping them get to that point. So now when they do take that shot, you know, hopefully they're doing things ethically and, and working for it and everything. But when they do, it's, it's a higher success rate. Um, again, just trying to stack the deck in their favor. But I think that, you know, it used to be, and I haven't been, uh, doing it nearly as long as those guys, but, uh, you know, the, the bows now are, are a lot more, um, universal. They're all good. You know, there's nothing that's really wrong. Now you're finding just one that you like that fits you. It's kind of just picking on a glove now, instead of finding one that's not going to blow up on you, uh, as much. And then the consistency and manufacturing and all that kind of stuff, you know, things are being done on computers, which is the, the counterpoint to everybody, but arrows are now more, uh, consistent and, uh, along with the bows, the components, uh, things are made better. Uh, the broadheads are getting, you know, better, better made, sharper, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it is moving in the right direction. Um, I think it's always going to be hard. You know, there's, you could take every shortcut you want, but to get the job done, it's, you'd have to put in the work. So, so that's, a, yeah. Oh, oh, sorry. Go yeah, ahead. No, I was just, I was just going to say, cause um, you know, Kyle and I did a test. So Kyle member, so yeah. I, I had long ago. <laughs> yeah. Cause you know, everybody's walking into an archery shop and, and Eric, you can attest to this because you and I have talked about this a little bit. Everybody walks up to the rack and they look for the 001. I need the straight straightest, the most tolerance, you know, tight tolerance, everything. And so when I got a hold of Kyle and I'm like, okay, I want you to put your money where your mouth is. Build me a, build me a budget arrow, go with the lowest grade that you have and build me a dozen budget arrows. Those things group just as good as walking in and spending almost twice the price on an 001. Right. Yeah, you're talking it, the difference of a human hair. <laughs> uh, no, that's what I tell people. So everybody's, this is going to make a lot of people mad, but whatever. Uh, it's the truth. Uh, the, I go to G into this, Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind, man. I, I don't say anything. Like with, I'm a mechanical engineer in my day job for everybody that doesn't know that. And I've spent my entire career in R&D. So I've been doing research and development in mechanical engineering the last 21 years. Uh, I'm, I'm older than people think that I am. Uh, but I mean, people would come in with a napkin sketch and then I would have to take that napkin sketch and make a product out of it. And that involved a lot of people, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, everything. We had to work together to do it. But uh, when I go in and say, you know, this arrow is an 005 or an 008 or an 006 or an 001 straightness, everybody's like, oh, give me the straight, you know, give me that straight 001. 
the difference between 003 and 001 is half of a human hair. And so, I mean, I make, if there's a better way to make an arrow, I try to find it and I try to do it. I am not half a human hair accurate with all my arrows, but, uh, you know, that's a, it's a big selling point to people is getting that straightness. I think that, uh, just on the arrow side, because that's all I really know, <laughs> uh, the, the, the consistency in the spine and the consist- consistency of the spine around the arrow and the consistency of the spine in the set is way more important than just about anything else. And if that spine is super consistent in the set, then that will uh, actually take care of like the weight of it because you can't have, they can't be very different in weights and not have consistency in the spine. So, yeah. And there are really, really expensive arrows out there that I've tested myself on my own spine gauge and uh, they're not good arrows. So, I mean, you know, you can build uh, a great arrow out of, you know, I think I made you gold tip hunters, I think, or velocities, one of the two. Yeah. And it's a good arrow. It's just not an expensive arrow. And there's, there's better arrows out there for, for certain reasons, but, uh, you know, you, you can, you could do a lot with a little. And I think that that's kind of what you guys are saying too. You know, you, you have a bow that's 15 years old and, uh, you know, you can go out and get the job done. It's, it's how it's tuned and how it works for you. What are you doing, Michael? You're flipping, you're flipping him on his head with all the information. <laughs> he just blown, he's just blowing me away with this knowledge. <laughs> so I'm going to throw it to Mr. Huntsman with, with what the guys have just said. Right. And, and I think Kyle framed it kind of perfectly. There is we're looking for shortcuts, right? In my opinion, everybody wants to, you, you automatically go to the gear, right? But you got to fix the archer first. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's there's a lot to be said. You, you hear this argument all the time on social media. You, you watch, you know, heaven forbid anybody bring up the 6.5 Creedmoor, right? And and, and <laughs> kick him you, off. You look at the <laughs> arguments between arrows and bows and mm-hmm. rifles and even muzzle loaders, and and there is something to be said for um, take what you have and learn how to use it well. Right. And because you guys, it sounds like just listening to you guys talk, you're a lot more technical than I am. Uh, I'm kind of like Joe. I've got a a 10 year old um, PSE stinger I'm still using. And I know Michael Batiste is going to be rolling his eyes at at my uh, my bow setup. But, um, you know, it's it's been working for me, you know, and and, uh, I I did. I did make a deal with my wife, though. We're we're looking at selling our house. And if, if the house sells. By like April fifteenth, I'm getting a new bow. I'm going to finally upgrade. Uh, <laughs> but for for me, I'm just not a super technical guy, um, and and I I don't spend a lot of time worrying about you know the, the some of these technical details that that even you guys are talking about. It's it's for me. It's I I have my bow, I have my arrows, I have my broadheads, and I shoot them a lot. Yeah. Um, and for the most part, it's served me well. Uh, and, uh, but there's also something that could be said. I, I think that I called both Michael and Joe this last September when I hit a bowl, uh, up on the mountain and I drove all the way to the top of the mountain to get phone service. And I was just, I was b- totally confused as to what happened. I don't, I don't quite know where the arrow hit. The bull ran off and I was, uh, I, I thought he was dead and I'd find him in the morning and just never did. And so I, I was running scenarios by those guys going crazy. And so there might be something you know, to that too. Maybe, maybe I'm not technical enough. And, and that's why what happened last September happened to me. And so that, that's just kind of, uh, I wouldn't say it's old school. I, I would say it's more of a lack of interest in, in super technical gear. Uh, Cause I, I, I just really don't have a lot of uh, high, high end technical gear that I'm, that I'm always upgrading. I, I find something that works and I keep it for Stick years with it. So I don't, I don't think it would have matter what you were using, but um, you know, sometimes we can do everything right. Totally right. And things can go to crap in a hurry and it, it happens. And yeah, uh, true. I, I, I've seen, you know, I had a hunter this year put it in the pocket, in the pocket, quartering away. And somehow that arrow hits, deflects, gets one lung and comes out eight inches behind the other lung on the other side. So what we should have had as a slam dunk ends up being a, a 30 hour search. For yeah. an animal, it that stuff happens. It happens. Yeah, it's heartbreaking. Heartbreaking. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Hmm. So I, I I wanted to have Garrett follow this whole thing up, but I but Jim <laughs> kind of brought it into 
where I think Garrett would fit in, right? Because out of all of us, I and and forgive me, guys, if I misplace you in this, but and I've always appreciated Garrett's quest to never stop advancing his craft in archery right and and not necessarily looking for an easier way but always looking for something that fit his scenarios and fit him better and i've always appreciated that and uh you know his staying in his lane if you will right and 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 kind of keeping us in that lane with him and sharing what i'm going to call a gear or archery adventure with everybody um so i think Jim's segue into Garrett was perfect. So Garrett with, you know, we look at what Jim was saying about, you know, this is, this ain't broke, no fix. And it's sort of like a Jillia thing. You know, you're on the opposite end of that spectrum <laughs> to a point, right? And it's not that it's broke, yeah. but that constant evolution, if you will. Yeah. I, I couldn't probably be more opposite. <laughs> so, uh, you know, if it's, if it's working perfectly, I, I seem to want to find the thing that doesn't work perfectly. Uh, <laughs> so everybody else can know about it. <laughs> so, uh, I'm constantly shooting. I get asked the question all the time, what broadheads and arrows am I shooting? And it's always, I don't know yet. Ask me in a week, ask me <laughs> when my arrows are in my quiver and I'm out on the trail or, you know, I don't know yet. And so, um, my perspective is, is, you know, you got to do what's best for you. Number one, um, if that's shooting, a, a, you know, an XX 75, uh, I think like Joe was talking about, then shoot an XX 75, you know, or shoot a mechanical. If you think that's what's best, I wouldn't suggest it, but, um, you know, do whatever, do whatever you think is going to make you the most successful because conf- I believe confidence pours into success. And, you know, I've seen guys that they couldn't, call their way out of a paper bag, but they were so confident and they knew what to say, maybe not the best way to sound good or say it. And they'll go out and kill elk every year. Right. I mean, I got cousin, um, who wears hickory and car hearts and kills one almost every opening weekend. It's just, I, I couldn't tell you about it. Right. So, um, but yeah, I, my lane is, is testing gear and finding out what works, finding, you know, how can I be a little bit more accurate? Um, is that building a better arrow? Is that tuning better? Is that shooting this workout versus shooting this workout? I mean, I just, I didn't, I don't think I posted it, but I was out in the middle of the pouring rain, um, testing my, my second and third access before last weekend's shoot. Cause my buddy Anthony drove over from bend and I was going to be damned if he was going to drive two and a half hours to come beat me. And so I was, I was, and I won. Um, <laughs> That's there. the whole sorry, point of the story. Anthony. Nothing else matters. Whole point, that was yeah. the whole point. Long way around. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, guys. So, but no, he shot really good. And, and, and I'm, you know, if I wouldn't have taken that little trip out to the range, I would have got, I would have got beat, you know? And so um, I'm super competitive, but I, I think, you know, to piggyback off of, I forget who it was that was saying it, but um you know, woodsmanship is, is kind of a cost of tech and, and, uh, on my platform, the last probably year, uh, or half a year, I've been stepping back from being more of a gear guy and, and trans transforming into woodsmanship and my episodes with the bro guys, that's pretty much all I want to hit on is woodsmanship skills because I've built myself up to be the gear guy, but honestly, what's costing me more opportunities and more success is my woodsmanship skills. Um, I've killed uh, elk at 81 yards, you know, right in the pocket, but I'm more proud of that 17 yard kill, right? Like that's a way cooler story. That's, that's the heart of bow hunting. And, and there's just two different dynamics there, but as a bow hunter, my perspective on the is a little bit different than Mike's is I'm not good enough uh, to get multiple shot opportunities a year. I'm taking the first one that's putting meat in my freezer that's inside my wheelhouse. And if that's 80 yards, which it is, I'm going to, I'm going to shoot it. Right. So I'm going to put that, that meat in my freezer and I'm going to work at getting better in the meantime. And so, um, and one thing that I've seen is tech has cost people opportunities. Absolutely. You have Onyx hunt guys are looking at their phone. There goes an animal. And if you would have been paying attention you would have killed it. And I had it, uh, I'll throw Anthony under the, under the bus again here. We were on sled <laughs> Springs last day and, uh, he's, he's figuring out his, uh, his next, uh, lady of the night. <clears throat> and here comes a bull walking up on his side as I'm, we have him coming in and we're waiting and, uh, he's, he's texting honeys and, 
<laughs> here comes this bull right up. And, and if you would have been paying attention, you would have said, Hey, you know, get ready, draw. And, and then, so the bull stops at 40 yards and I have my bow on my shoulder and I'm like, yeah, this isn't going to happen. And then he trots off. So that's his fault. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's, that's technology. I mean, phones, um, the, the zero Garmin site, electronics on your bow, Onyx. I mean, Onyx has made me a lot more successful, but I guarantee you it's costed me animals I don't even know about. So woodsmanship is going to kill more animals than any, any technology any day. I, I, and I will stand by that statement, but being a more capable hunter is, is all part of the journey. And that's, that's kind of where my lane comes into is, is increasing your, your capabilities as an archer. If yeah, I, your effectiveness. Yeah. If, if I could take that just a little bit to the other side, though, what Garrett's talking about on X is, yes, I, I agree what he's saying. But on the other hand, it has increased the ability for somebody to hunt fearlessly. Mm -hmm. Um and especially if they have woodsmanship skills. And I think for a lot of guys that brought woodsmanship to the game in the first place, that it was able to combine Onyx with that. It's like, no, oh, I don't have to worry about knowing where that fence line is. I don't have to worry about seeing that one uh, landmark all the time. If that bull bugles, I don't care where that's coming from. I'm diving because I have something that's a little bit safer in my pocket and I'm going to get back. And it doesn't matter if it's two hours after dark, I'm going to get there. So I really think, and it was before it was just the GPS. I mean, the GPS before <laughs> Onyx ever came in, just to have the ability to, to put that, that compass on that GPX, point it back to camp or your bike or mm -hmm. wherever you're going and, and not have to worry. In fact, you didn't even, you know, cause the early GPS is batteries only lasted so long, but you were able to get, convert that to your compass and you were heading in the right direction no matter what. So I I think for me, that was one of the biggest game changers because it didn't matter if, if I was in Southern New Mexico and one corner or another one, it didn't matter how well I knew the area. If I knew elk and I knew where to look for them. And if I heard one, they were in trouble because I was going, I had no second thoughts of closing the deal. So in that sense, I think it really changed the game and made a lot of guys way more successful. Do you yeah, think, I Joe, I, or go ahead. Do you think, Joe, that like, you know, you're, you're shooting your older bow. Do you think that uh, with more advancements in technology, because like a lot of guys that I build for, uh, they don't have time to build their own arrows and they don't have time to do a lot of the testing and things like that. So what I give them is kind of what you're talking about is, you know, if you put your pin on it, that arrow is going to go where it needs to go. They're going to be consistent. Uh, do you think that that kind of maybe those advancements help that as well, allow people to focus more on the hunt than, you know, worrying if their bow's going to blow up or anything? If, if they're that kind of minded person, though, Kyle, but what I've seen is just the opposite thing. It's kind of like I was a coach for years and I coach high jumpers and I coach pole vaulters. And instead of remembering that their goal was to fly and jump high, it was like, well, my right foot was too far this way. I leaned too yeah. much that way. You know, <laughs> all of this noise. stuff where I, I have guys in my own crew that uh, we always keep judos on our bow because we like to shoot judos the whole time, really keeps mm -hmm. you in, keeps you hot during the hunt. And one of the guys in our crew, every time he shoot, he's shooting off to the left, man. And he's like, yeah, that's that daggum arrow, man. It's just that dag. And, and it's like in his head and he's, he's yeah. already trying to figure why this has happened and stuff. I said, let me see your arrow. And so I grab his judo and we always shoot stuff that's just sitting out there. I pull it back, let it fly, nail it. And he looks at me and he's like, it's not your weight. <laughs> it's not your length. <laughs> it's none of that, but you pulled it back and you, he's like, I'm shutting up, you know, instead of complaining, <laughs> you know, yeah, I, I just don't like when the technology gets in the way of the head and they find excuses yeah. within it. That's all. Yeah. I think you need to yeah, keep the excuses and keep your, uh, not rely on it and not look to it as a crutch, but if it's helping you with the hunt, I think it's a good thing. Oh, yeah. I'm the first one to say, if it helps somebody be accurate and, and have a quick ethical, responsible kill, yeah. <laughs> man, I'm all, all for, for it. it. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I, Joe, I agree with what you just said because, you know, we've always had that same mentality also. We hear a bugle and our mentality is, 
let's get after it. Let's get it on the ground. We'll figure out how to get it out of here later. Yeah. And, and I mean, before on X and all that, yeah, I mean, brutal, brutal pack outs into some gnarly holes. And, and now that is kind of a nice feature to where you can pull that up and go, man, there's an old cut road right over here. So instead of going straight up, we're going to go down through the bottom, pop up a little bit on the other side and take that old cut road out, which yeah, now you do have that ability to, man, there's a bugle in the bottom of that canyon where a lot of people will just stay up on the ridge and go, I ain't going down in there. <laughs> but do you, Mike, do you think that's lent itself to people looking at the contours on that map and saying, oh, hell no, even hearing that bugle? <laughs> It, it depends on the mindset. Yeah, you will have those people that are like, eh. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because we're, we're, we're the idiot ones that are going to go like, there's a bugle. Well, let's go. Yo. And, you know, then we're down on the bottom. And then it's like, um, did you bring a knife and a fork? Because we're going to have to put this dude down here. We're Roast not bread, man. <laughs> so, um, so, so no, I, I think it goes both ways. You know, I think some people, you know, we'll take a look at it. We'll take a look at those contour lines and go, you know what? We can go find elk in an easier spot. That's going to be easier to get it out. But those people that are really. <laughs> Garrett's lying. I've seen that rosy country he hunts. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> yeah, but no, other, other people, it, it, it does. It gives them that confidence that they're like, you know what? Hey, I can get this animal out of here. Packing an elk off the mountain is not an easy task. So, I mean, right. it's flat out work. And, and so if you have that ability to where you can find an alternate route out of there or this or that. And I think too, is it, it's a great tool, you know, pop up on your computer at home and really scout your area. And like Joe touched on, get to know your area even better better. And it's amazing how all of a sudden you find little tiny hidden pockets. Cause that, that's one thing that I've loved about it when out hunting the area and you stumble across something, it's like, man, I never even knew this was here. Drop a pin. You know how to find your way back to that instead of God, I think we're heading the right direction. Do you remember that tree over there? Did we go left of the tree or right of the tree or how do we get in there? So it gets you back into some of those spots. But at the same time, make sure you're not a passenger. Right. Make sure that you're a driver because those guys that just start looking down at that and just, yeah. you know, following that magnetic, you know, pin going someplace, they forget to look behind them to see what it looks like where they've just yep. come from and, and yep. pay attention to the areas around them. So just don't be a passenger in the process. Be an active participant. I, and that's, I, I pride that's myself. I pride myself in being able to, to walk in the woods and be lost, but not get lost. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that yeah. to me, that that is a huge part of woodsmanship is being able to get those bearings, keep those bearings and know that path you're on. Right. And I think a lot of that comes from, you know, a lot of the map time before Onyx um, and, and just spending time, you know, in that country or on those maps and understanding what you're diving into. Uh, Caesar will tell you, man, I, I'll just I'll just get going and we'll just walk, 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 walk. <laughs> and it's like, OK, we're here. Let's go. Over. You know, you just there's something about that. That's right. that's very, very satisfying, especially when you don't notch the damn elk tag. <laughs> yeah, I have to say that, that was pretty impressive. That, that was one of the first things I noticed that when we went up there, how you were just going and I was the one in the back with on X. Although I will say, I will say that I was trying my hardest not to be a, a, a participant myself. You know, I was looking down, but I was also trying to look up cause I didn't want to get lost. <laughs> So, yeah, let's you know, to, let's it, well, it, hold on. Hold on. My, oh, I'm sorry. Let's get to Mr. Riker. I want to get through these oh. and then we'll, then we'll go crazy. So, so Chad, how, how do you streamline it? Right. How do we take all this information, the flood, and then how do you streamline that and figure out what works for you in terms of getting that archery going to where that confidence is up so you can go in the woods and do what we're setting out to do? I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but I don't listen to, to any of you. I pick up my bow, <laughs> I take my yeah, bow, buddy. <laughs> and I go out and I shoot it and I become confident in that bow, right? There's so much. And I respect all of you guys on here. I'm just kidding when I say I don't <laughs> listen to you because I truly do. But there's so much other garbage out there on the social media platforms that are telling all the all of the these tips and tricks and all of these things. And the fact of the matter is, is you need to grab your bow and you need to go shoot it. And you need to not care about what anybody says, except for Garrett Weaver. 
God bless the Guerrero <laughs> Weaver. Uh, hey, you know what? No. I will say, dude. Okay, Garrett. Garrett puts up some stuff that, and I'm not, it's not left field, right? But it, it's it's this thought process that Garrett has, and and he was saying that like, how do how do you improve that? And and some of the stuff has been phenomenal and you know garrett's quite a few years younger than most of us but i can look yeah. back to some of garrett's earlier videos and and i told <laughs> garrett when i met him at hoodoo like dude i love i love the information you put out one it's this unbiased approach just from his view like hey if you like it you like it you don't you don't but man the, the, chad i agree that it just works because Garrett spends so much time thinking about, well, maybe not that much time. Sorry, I don't want to make it sound like that. But he puts so <laughs> what what feels like so much thought process and heart into what he's doing it is just it, it's beautifully put together, and you can take so much more away from something he's doing than some damn, you know, some guy tinkering because he's selling sale yeah. pitch in his fifteen percent. No offense to anyone out there. I will I'm tell I'm you, button my hat here just because my head's getting bigger. By the second <laughs> you I know. So I will tell you that. I love technology. I love everything about it. And I love tinkering with new things. Um, I I think a lot of times people will say things like, you know, Joe's talking about his 15 year old bow and how he doesn't like to make change, but he's getting on a four wheeler and he's riding that four wheeler out. And I think a lot of times people refuse to to take a technology that's out there because they're so comfortable with something, but you'll use all, every other new technology that's available to you. That's a you, good point. You know, Damn good and point. it's because it, and I'll also point down here towards Kyle too, because I, I think that we have resources out, out here that can help us. I don't have time to build my own arrows, man. I don't build my own, own arrows. I don't like fletching arrows. I don't like doing anything with arrows. And if I could buy a kick-ass arrow from a guy like Kyle, and that saves me a whole afternoon or even a whole day or however long it takes me to screw up a dozen arrows and try to re-fletch them and then screw them up again and redo them again. That's a day where I could be out shooting a hundred arrows at a target. And I know yeah. that I'm getting quality because I promise you, Kyle can make a way better product than what I can make. No doubt in my mind, which will then increase that accuracy and increase that confidence. So there's a, there's a trail there. Could I put the time and effort into it to become a very good Fletcher and to, to set up my own arrows? Probably I probably could, but I'm not going to, I can tell you that I'd rather put that time into, I could, I could put it all kinds of different places family so that I know when it's coming time for me to go hunting, I've put all that family time in and I'm ready to leave for 10 days or whatever it is. So yeah. I think that we have options out there that really can help us. And we do have new technologies that can help us. Some of it I don't agree with, right? I, I don't really agree with the zero side and some of these other things that are out there. But I do think that we do have technology that is just putting us light years ahead. My my first bow when I was like 12 years old was a little Hoyt Game Getter Junior thing that had no break over. Like that thing was terrible, you know, and I put a bow down for about, I, I don't remember, about 10 years after I was a kid. And when I picked up my first newer model bow, that thing was incredible, right? Like I can't believe some of the advancement that's happened in, in bows. Like you would never think it could. I look at my, I keep pointing over here because I got my bow sitting over here, but um, <laughs> I look at this thing and I can't like what it's five or 10 years from now, man, what are we going to have? What are these things going to be like five or 10 years? Anyway, sorry yeah. about that. That's that was right. a ramble. That was perfect. <laughs> All right. So uh, last and least <laughs> uh, Caesar. So with, yes, with, with everything we talked about and with mm -hmm. what Chad just said, and I was trying to tie this this way. And since you're early in your archery career, influence versus practical use, what have you seen as you're streaming all this information and now you're taking that, you know, to the range and then beyond the range into the woods? I mean, I think at first uh, I, I I felt like I've, I've been doing this kind of arc thing here. And so at first I, I knew nothing. Right. I just was trying to learn as much as I could. And then I realized the sorts of technologies that you could use with your bow. Now, it's interesting to hear how um, since I've only been doing this for five years, like techno the technology in bows in the last five years. I mean, I don't know that it's changed a ton, a ton. Like I, I shoot a triax and that was, you know, I bought that bow three years ago. So like 
you know, the dra- the drastic changes you guys are talking about, like I haven't seen that. So, you know, I know what I know, right? But at the beginning, at the beginning, it was like I knew nothing. And then I just wanted to consume all archery information as much as I could and try to do everything on my own, or at least as much as I could on my own. And, you know, a lot of that has to do because the uh, archery shops here in Southern California suck. So I had to figure it out on my own. I, I suck. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. It's, it's very then, funny. I hear that all over the country, though. Like people yeah, tell me that. It's not all the just time. Southern California. Oh, yeah. no, dude. It's, it's, and, and I've been to a bunch of shops in a bunch of Western states, and, and he ain't not, there's not a shade of BS in that one. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so then it turned into this like, uh, uh, I'm just going to get as much of the best stuff as I could. And and then eventually I started realizing that like, you know, I need to, I need to shoot more. I need to, sh- you know, this is all nice, but you know, I need, I just need to shoot more. And I think over the last maybe year, I've kind of gotten into this point where, especially in the last few months, actually, I was thinking to myself, should I get a new bow? Should I get new something? I just don't feel the need to, cause it's like, uh, I I'd rather just shoot my bow, bow more. Like, I feel like I still group really well. I don't. So I feel like I've done this. Like I want, I don't know anything and I don't have anything to this. I want everything. And I'm trying to learn everything to this. I kind of like what I have right now and I'll shoot this for maybe another year or two. I don't know. Depends on how I feel, but you know, that's kind of, I mean, I think the technology in the, at least for me, I mean, I, I think at the end of the day, if you're not shooting, it don't matter. You know, you, that's just, you know, at the end of the day, that's all that matters. If you're not shooting, you know, you, you could, you could be 10 yards and if you're not practicing and you know how to shoot 10 yards with your 30 yard pin or whatever, like, Hey, it ain't going to happen. (laughs) Uh, And that, I mean, that really rounds up this entire part of this conversation, right? It goes back to the archer um, in, in, in every aspect of this. It's, you know, shooting, becoming the better archer, doing what works for you. The time behind the string is, is ultimately what's going to measure our ability as archers, as, you know, bow hunters. Um, I like to say archery hunters, right? Because if you're diving into it like this, it's, it's definitely an archery world and not a, not a bow hunt bow hunt world um <laughs> so i'm gonna jump in i want to talk about process right and i'm gonna start this one off with garrett um garrett talk talk us through your process as as fast as you can right when you're looking at getting you know in those off months um and you're like hey i want to shoot this weight arrow this year with this much foc and this component and then taking that from uh your your table in the shop to the range, what's that process look like, you know, getting prepped for the next season? Um, well, my, my goal is honestly, um, is to be ready to shoot a broadhead at an animal 365 days a year. Right. So that you're always on top of your equipment because you never know when that surprise pick hunt's going to come. You never know spring bear season, you may get a shot, whatever it may be. So I'm, I'm always refining and, but I'm always shooting broadheads and I'm always technically, you know, rabbit ears tuned. Um, but for me, I'm, I'm figuring out what I like, what I don't like actually during the season. I'm not making any changes cause I'm, um, stuck with what I'm stuck with during season, but my, my stuff comes from requests, you know, a, a new arrow that comes out, ARWD arrows, or maybe, uh, arachnid arrows or whatever. Those are the ones I keep getting hit up about right now. And then I'll go look at those. I'll test those out. I'll test out new fletchings, but I'm always shooting broadheads and stuff. And, and honestly, it's, it's keeping the edge. It doesn't take more than a couple of weeks to really lose an edge or even a week, honestly. And if you're a trad bow, you need to be shooting almost every day, um, if not every day. So um, <sighs> compound stuff, you can get away with a little, a little bit more. But my process, I guess, is... Uh, what are my plans? What do I plan on being hunting? I, I build for worst case scenario, which for me would be elk. Um, and I can go to Africa with elk. I can go to, uh, you know, with an elk arrow, I can go to Alaska. I can do whatever. I can kill a grizzly bear. You know, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. An elk, you know, if I build a 500 grain arrow shooting 270 feet per second, I can kill pretty much anything. So um, it really comes down to head selection. What's the hot buzz ones? What ones can I dispel quickly? Um, you know, you got like, I'll just 
Zeus, for example, that was like, oh my God, Zeus was like the coolest broadhead two years ago or a year ago. And it was like, yeah, let's test that real quick just so we can knock that one out, right? Like get that one out of the pool and tell people, yeah, there's other other heads on the market there. But um, And then keeping in shape, which I had post elk season depression this year. Uh, I had the worst year I've ever had in the hunting woods and I did not care after I came out. I gained 15 pounds in between November and January. Um, I ate everything in sight and I didn't run, I didn't do anything. And so that's where my fitness journey is coming back into play here. So, um, I don't know if that answers your question, huh? I said, I knew I'd like you. (laughs) (laughs) you, I don't don't know. 15 pounds you lost. I'll take them. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I don't know if that answers your question. I mean, um, honestly, it's, it's, it's easier to keep an edge than it is to to get one back. And it's easier to stay in shape than it is to get in shape. And, and if you're not ready to go hunting 365 days a year, you're, you're doing something wrong, man. Cause you, you, there should always be something on the table, something that you're looking forward to something that you're excited about. Um, axis deer are hitting in July, you know, like there's places you can go hunt an axis deer in Hawaii and they're hard horned or there's just so many opportunities out there. And instead of buying gear and a new bow, I'm still shooting the evoke 31, which is like what a two year old bow. Um, I haven't done that since I made the transition into woodsmanship and buy opportunities instead of gear. Right. So, um, that's, that's my spill, I guess, is, is stay, keep that edge and, and, refine, but don't ever lose the edge. I mean, that's my process right now is shoot all the time and work out all the time and figure out what my next hunt is. So Mr. Huntsman, you go with the same thing, which what's your, your process, be it, you know, off season or, or that two weeks before season, when you pull your bow out, (laughs) (laughs) you know, I, uh, I, in full disclosure, I used to be that guy. Um, I, I would, I would pull my bow, bow out, you know, two weeks before season and, uh, th- this was years ago, but I'm, I'm on team Garrett right now with that. I, I think that it's, it's critical that, uh, you know, that there's, there's like this hashtag going around that there is no off season and, and, you know, you can make light of that, but really there's not. And especially for where, where I'm, I live, you know, it's, it's, there's always something going on other than in the dead of summer in, in July and August, I don't have any seasons other than that. It's, it's either elk season, it's deer season, it's bear season. I'm hunting wolves, uh, turkeys. And you know, it just, it just is kind of continuous. And to, to Garrett's point where, you know, I kind of did the same thing where I came out of this last season and I, I got a little bit lethargic and, and, uh, it got, got out of shape that, uh, and, and that's not like me. I'm, I, I like to stay in shape and, and I'm no, you know, I, I'm not like, uh, as physical as uh, Garrett, look, you, you look like you're in a lot better shape than me. And, Go look and, at Garrett's and, uh, last and, post in the gym. <laughs> he disagrees. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, it's, 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 a. Uh, I think that, and, and we talk about this a lot on my show, like hunting is a lifestyle. It's not, it's not a, for, for most of us that take hunting serious, it's not just this passive hobby, like bottle collecting. Right. And, and it's not something we just kind of do a couple of weekends out of the year. This, this is serious stuff. And, and I listen to everybody's podcast. I, I, I watch everybody's videos. I, I do all the things necessary to kind of keep me in the game and the right headspace year round. Uh, because it, it's made me a lot better hunter. It's, it's been a, it's been, a, it's made a big difference, you know? And so, um, yeah, I, I think that, uh, that if you're asking specifically what my process is, I don't know that I have, I, I can answer that because my process is changing a lot too. Uh, you know, the, the amount of times I shoot my bow and, and, or even a rifle, uh, like right, I've got a rifle sitting in here right now because I've got a coyote next door killing my neighbor's chickens, and I'm, he, I know he's crossing right behind this window behind me. So I'm gonna I'm gonna get him. I'm hoping to get him on the show. <laughs> get him on the mm-hmm. show. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, the process, my process, uh, it it always changes. I, I mean, it's what I'm doing to gear up for bear season this year is totally different than what I was doing last year because I'm gonna try baiting this year. So I'm gonna haul a 55 gallon barrel up on the mountain. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've never done that before. Um, and it's, it's going to be interesting. And so, you know, um, I, I think that the important thing is just to have a process and a mindset of preparation as season is coming. And it, it doesn't really need to be something super specific or, uh, you, you know, uh, you d- d- don't fall into, into some of these trends that go on out there. Uh, just have some kind of planning, some kind of method 
and, and mindset that every day I am doing something to make myself a better outdoorsman or a hunter or a woodsman. I really like the woodsman discussion. Um, and so that's, that's the kind of stuff that uh, I, I think that uh, would be important to, to pay attention to for sure. So, so in that, I mean, and, and you guys both answered in line of, of how I thought, right. If, if we are truly trying to measure our success, be it in the bear woods, the deer woods, the elk woods, chasing pigs, or in Garrett's case, a, a high dollar access hunt, you, you really measure your success throughout the entire year, right? You're not, you can't limit your, your effort and success to that two weeks before season and then the time you spent out on the mountain, it's really measured from, you know, when that season ends to what you're going to put up into that season, <laughs> you know, going, uh, going forward. So I'm going to, this is a, a joint question. I'll let both of you guys answer since you were a uh, girlfriend and up Mr. Batiste and, and uh, Gilia there. Um, <laughs> Gilia. Gilia. <laughs> Who's gonna take whose name with this girlfriend yeah. thing? That's what I want to know. So it's it's hyphenated. So yeah. it, the, there's something there's something interesting that Mike did, um, and he pulled his peep off his bow, right? And when Mike said, "I'm taking my peep off my bow," I said, "Mike's a fucking lunatic." Like, <laughs> <laughs> there's no re- there's no reason for this, right? This is this is craziness. But then Joe, that's just a Joe thing, right? So. Understanding your equipment is what I want you guys to to get into. So I'll let you guys argue lovers quarrel about who goes first on that. But I want you both to hit that. <laughs> I'll, I'll let age before beauty. So Joe, go right ahead. <laughs> yeah. So you were talking about a process before. So I be I am going to be fifty nine in November. So I'm like knocking on that sixty door up there, and so there's a lot of things I have to do. So yeah, I'll take the age part of it there. Uh, and I want to be, I want to be kind of clear on something too, is that I shoot what I shoot, not because I am anti anything, you know, all of my buddies, I mean, uh, Luis is just incredible. I mean, he's doing the adult arrow thing. He does a lot of tests like Garrett does. You know, I watched all of Garrett's broadhead tests that he did. I was just enthralled by that, man. I just love his scientific approach that he did with the bros. Then. And then, so you know, it's not that I'm anti that. It's just that I'm kind of like my bow is like an extension of me. Like when you talk about you have to shoot, you have to shoot. I never think about that because I'm a I'm an archer. I'm a bow hunter. I'm I'm shooting whether it's rabbits, squirrels, uh, anything I can find, man. I just love to shoot. And I as being instinctive, I have to shoot anywhere from 80 to 120, 140 arrows a day, you know, just to stay in that kind of tune. So because I shoot by when I'm out there and that animal comes out, it's, it's, it's by that feel it's, it's by, um, I guess you guys know what I mean. When you look at something, it's kind of like a guy that does a pistol. You can kind of point at it, know where it's going and boom, it's there. Right. So I have to have that. And if I'm going to be responsible to put an animal down, I had better put the time in. And, you know, so my piece of equipment, yeah, it's like, it's, it's a lot like Caesar said is that it might be 15 years old, but my bow still (laughs) shoots 270 feet per second. You know, I mean, uh, it shoots a, a, a broadhead on the front of an arrow and it passes through animals, man. And th- that is what you want out of your equipment. And you want the person behind it to put it in the right spot where it needs to happen. That's the equation. I, I think what I do better and what I think makes me successful is not so much the equipment the equipment just becomes an extension of me. It's that I am able to eliminate failure points. So whenever there's so many times that we are in great situations and encounters and we don't capitalize on that because of small failure points along the way that we either haven't found because of our equipment or because we've changed the equipment or we haven't worked with our equipment and the rest of the gear that we're doing or we haven't done things in conditions. So it it has nothing to do with the fact that I wouldn't want to be shooting a different bow. In fact, I just found out today uh, one, I'm, I'm a guide, so I'm usually hunting a certain time of the year and then I'm guiding the rest. So I don't get to hunt as much as the rest of you guys, believe it or not, even though I spend a ton of time in the woods, right? Well, but I just found out, uh, 
one of my clients is sending me a new bow. And I'm like, <laughs> what am I going to do, man? You know, it's like uh, I'm in this quandary right stressing now. Stressing you out but, a little bit. Uh, uh, what's that? <laughs> I says it's stressing you out a little bit. It is it? a little bit, dude, because I, I think my bow is a lot. Um, I've been married to my wife for 39 years, <laughs> right? And uh, I mean, when you find something that works, you stick with it. And if you know how it works and it's, and I, and I'll tell you another thing too. I think a lot of, if you look at all my stuff in the past coming up to a certain point, I'm a retired teacher coach. So my income level raising a family did not allow me to buy different equipment all the time. Um, I would have probably done that exploration, but my money had to go into tags. My money had to go into putting gas in my vehicle. My money had to go into things so that I could be in the woods hunting elk. Right. And I want to make a statement real quick. I'm sorry to cut you off, but there's absolute in in some respects, that's the right path to be on. Right. And and I want to make sure that we're you know, this is not this question isn't or when we're joking with Joe about, you know, sticking with that. There's a point to that. Um, And it's not a slash or anything by any stretch of the imagination. I just want to be clear. I know you know that, but I want to make sure that folks that are hearing that understand that this is a group of guys. The majority of us go back and forth uh, on the phone and and text and DMs, things like that. So I just want to be clear. So people don't think we're smashing on the old guy in here that he can't defend himself. Listening to Joe talk and, and, and just in hearing about his success in the woods. I mean, him and I couldn't be more opposite on the gear part. Yeah. And look at his success rate compared to mine. You know, it's it that should speak volumes just about the. I mean, I I hear Joe and I'm just thinking woodsmanship. Yes, woodsmanship, woodsmanship, yeah. woodsmanship. And he's like he reminds me of um, a killer out there. I friend of mine, Trent Fisher from Born and Raised. He doesn't know what he's shooting. He couldn't tell you what arrow, barely what broadhead. Sure as hell couldn't tell you what grain it is. And the guy's a straight up <laughs> killer, right? I mean. And he's, I mean, that's just, it speaks volumes to me. The guys that I know that have killed, you know, some guys over a thousand animals with a bow, some guys, you know, a lot of guys less, obviously, but you know, I've talked, the biggest killers I've talked to, they don't care. They go out and they just get it done. And that's just echoing what Joe's saying there. And I'm really envious of, of the success you've had um, and, and sticking with it. I mean, that's, that's pretty cool. That, Joe, that's, I have a question oh, for sorry, you. Uh, sorry. Uh, so you, you've been using the last, the same setup for the last 15 years, you said? So other than it's, I've been doing the same thing. The bow has changed out because I blew up a bow, right. like I said. And so I actually had to go to a different bow. And up to that point, I was shooting a Pearson spoiler for a while. I had shot Pearson Grey Ghost, you know, and uh, uh, you, yeah, you're smiling up there, guys. You recognize <laughs> stuff, yeah. right? I started out with the old PSE Nova that was $104 off the, you know, off the rack up there. Um, it It was just about propelling an arrow and knowing how I could pick up your bow Caesar and in 10 shots, in 10 shots, I'll be hitting because I learned the feel of your bow and I can adjust to that. Right. So uh, I guess the the question I have is, is previous to you shooting the same bow for 15 years or however long, mm -hmm. were you a tinkerer before that? In other words, did you get to the setup that you have because you came across a bunch of equipment you didn't like until you found the equipment you did like? No, it came down to the piece of equipment that I could afford. Or at one time I was shooting for Pearson. So they sent me bows, right? So I would shoot their bow. And it came down to tuning my bow so that I was getting a punch and know that I was flying an arrow straight. And then from there, it it was all on me to know what that bow was doing from 10 yards to 80 yards. And that that's what I did. It wasn't anything about tinkering other than making sure the bow was punching a hole. Right. That's it. Okay. And then the rest came to me. So Mike, take that, take that same question away. Yeah. So, so no, and, and, and I agree with, you know, what Joe was saying there and, and, and same thing. I mean, I mean, I mentioned before that, you know, when I'm hunting elk, I want to eliminate as many variables as possible. And, and to me, the peep site was one of those things that is an, that is a variable. I mean, how many of you have drawn back and your peep hasn't rotated all the way and you're sitting there with your lip or your tongue trying to turn it. Now, has that ever happened when there's an animal in front of you and it costs you a shot? So it, it, it's happened to me in the past, but then also 
too, is, you know, I turned 51 this year and, and all of a sudden, you know, my eyes changed and in my sight picture just wasn't that great looking through that peep site. And, you know, I talked to a lot of people and they're like, well, you just need to go to a smaller peep. But then you want to open it back up when you're hunting so that, you know, light can gather in. And I'm like, I don't want to be making all these changes. So, you know, everybody's mentioned it, having confidence in your equipment. And the way you get confidence is by shooting that equipment and practicing with that that equipment. Well, in archery, the way you increase accuracy is by repetition, doing the same thing over and over and over again. So if you're consistently doing the same thing with your front hand, if you're consistently anchoring in the same place and you're consistently doing all of those things, I was sitting there one time going, do I really need this peep sight? So I pulled the peep sight out and basically go to a three-point anchor system. I shoot a thumb release. So I take my knuckles. They're right behind my jaw. I have a kisser button and then I have a nose button. So those three Mm. points are there all the time. It doesn't change the way I'm looking at the pin. Now, I've shot a single pin sight for so many years. With that single pin sight, you start getting 60, 70, 80 yards. You have to change your anchor just a little bit. And in fact, Dan with Trophy Taker, he has two different kisser buttons depending on yardages. So he changes his anchor point so that the, you know, looking through the peep. As soon as I removed that peep sight out of the equation, I don't have to change my anchor point anymore with shooting a single pin. It now basically turns almost into a multi-pin sight that I get the single pin sight picture. And I'll tell you what, the sight picture on an animal, when you are not looking through a, a, a peep, there's no question. How many of you have been looking through your peep in a low light situation going, God, am I behind the front shoulder or am I in front of the back shoulder? Is he really side broadside? Is he quartering two? Is he quartering away? And so shooting both eyes open, no peep, your target acquisition is faster so you can execute the shot. And, you know, Guy, yeah, you've heard me talk before about aim small, miss small. And, and, you know, I do this small dot training with a dot at that big at 20 and 30 yards. I'm doing that on an elk. And with both eyes open with that sight picture, I can pick that tuft of hair. I can pick that clump of mud. And now my OCD kicks in and says, man, run that broadhead right through that clump. <laughs> so, uh, but no, for, for me, it was, it, it was removing another variable, something that could affect my hunt out there. I mean, you know, working hard to get that shot opportunity. I don't want something not turning and costing me that opportunity. That's interesting, right? I mean, if if I said, hey, show of hands, boys, if one of the variables could be removed, the last thing I'm going to think of, right, is my peep sight. I, I, I mean, that's just not something at least at this point, right. That I, that I would say I'm comfortable with his saying, yeah, I'll take my peep off. Right. It just, <laughs> man, that, that is something else. But then I noticed that, you know, you're, you got your, your boy got his first bow, right. He's in the, he's yep. on the range with you now. So congratulations yep. on that. Um, you. But you're starting him without the peep. Exactly. So, because, and, and I think part of it goes back to, you know, just like Joe mentioned where I started in archery with a recurve and shooting instinctive, so those instinctiveness, they're ingrained in there. And, and so, you know, if something happens and just like, you know, Joe said, a couple of my hunting partners, we have the same exact draw. So I can grab their bow and know that I, if I take their bow and still do the same things, In just a couple of shots, I'm going to be drilling with their bow. So if I have my bow blow up because I drug it through the mud like Joe did on his four-wheeler and it blows up (laughs) on me, I can grab their bow and and, and hunt. But yeah, I I wanted Knox to experience that. And, you know, Liz, my girlfriend, got her started shooting and she's, I got her started on the small dot. Man, it's funny when, you know, we shoot three, four nights a week and you can just see that OCD and the teeth clenching because she's not putting all three arrows in that little tiny dot at 20 yards. And, and so I joked with her and I'm like, let's yank your peep side out. And so she's shooting without it too. No, she still has the peep side in for right now. Garrett, have you ever shot without the peep? No, no, you got it. When you, I would, I would like to. Yeah, I would, I would say I would probably you test give it that. A you try. Let us know how that goes. I, I can see the wheel <laughs> I, I'll say I got a BTX. I don't really care about that much. I can just <laughs> take the peep side out of that. So I will tell you a peep side story. Happened this year. You know, Gilbert Ornelas, uh 
great friend of mine, Gilbert out to 70, 80. He's, he's just like, you know, you guys that, that shoot that and, and, and tag them like that. And he has a bull broadside at 34 yards, pulls back and his peep is turned. And there he is trying to turn it with his nose it was a failure point. And he ends up letting this bull walk and you only get so many opportunities, man. They, that, that only happens so many times out there. And when he comes to me, he's like, Joe, man, my peep turned around I'm like at 34 yards. And that was a problem. You know, why didn't you drop that down a little bit and pop that puppy or, you know, couldn't you look on the side of your peep? And, and we had that conversation and I was like, you know what, Gilbert, I know that's going to be a problem because that was a failure point. And I know the next time, if that happens, you will have practiced. So without using your peep and found a way so that if that ever happens again, you're still going to be able to shoot that animal. And so we go back to camp. That's the first thing he's doing, you know, is he's shooting and he's changing how he's looking, looking to the side of his peep instead and realize what he has to do for that to happen. So again, you know, that's why, uh, you know, pins that get loose, you know, that can happen, man. You got a peep that can twist on you. That can happen. You can have a release that goes off early on you. You know, it's just those types of things that become those little failures that become huge in a season. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That missed opportunity. I mean, it's a 10% yes, game. You gotta, you gotta try and stay out of that 99 somehow or that, that 90 somehow. Right. And I guess that uh, lends itself to it. I gotta say, you know, man, that, that no peep thing seems really interesting to me, especially what you're saying with the three points, you know, the, the kisser and the nose button. Like, I mean, at the end of the day, you think about it, right. It's all about your anchor. So what does it matter what you're looking through, right. right? So long as you're anchored in the right spot, same spot every single time, and you have the kisser and the and the nose button. I yeah. don't know. I'm I'm intrigued. And you can go to my Instagram page or Facebook page, you know, at the Elk Calling Academy, and I I posted pictures of my group. I'm getting groups like this at 50, 60 yards. Yeah, it's it's no, pretty impressive. With no peep. Yeah. yeah, it's pretty impressive. I might have so. to try that out. No, yeah, not me. I'll, I'll watch you when we're at the range and see how hey. that goes. <laughs> okay, all I'm that. saying is if you're going to keep a peep, find out what you're going to do if if it fails on you. Have that ability. Okay, That's all I'm saying. Oh. I mean, so Mike, now, are, you I shoot, mean, are you shooting the uh, adjustable sight, Mike? Yep. Yep. Still single pin. Hmm. It's interesting. Me too. It's Me very, too, very interesting. And, and I get asked that a lot too. It's it's like, well, I don't want to sit there and range and I don't want to adjust. And I don't. When I'm elk hunting, my single pin is set at 30 yards. And then I practice enough with Kentucky windage that I know where I'm going to hit at 20 and I know where I'm going to hit at 40. Absolutely. So I know exactly what it's going to perform. And actually, in so many people, and I'll have this conversation, and they're like, I'm, I'm never going away from my seven pin sight. And I'm like, oh, you know, that's your choice. The reason I went away is because I didn't want all this group of pins coming in from the side. I want this vertical that I can run that vertical right up the back of the leg. And then I can set my pin. And honestly, my average shot on all my elk harvested is 22 yards. So why not open up that sight picture? Why not eliminate all those other things? So like I said, then I can find that tuft of hair that's out of place and drill that sucker. You know, the simpler things are the keep it simple, stupid type thing. And how many times have you heard somebody say, I shot the wrong pin? Yep. Yeah. You no, know, I've shot the wrong pin. And I, I've always encouraged guys. I'm like, there should be nothing that you're not able to kill with three pins. Mm -hmm. Nothing. And uh, even by knowing how to gap those pins, man, yeah. I mean, it's uh, you should be able to do that. You don't again, they're they're relying that it's like a crutch. I think it's more of a crutch of it or, you know, than anything. And I think a lot of those multiple pins come from guys that come from, you know, the hunting style where they get to be in a stand and they have all day to start, you know, finding and looking and then you get a bull that comes in and he's on top of you before you know it and he's screaming and like gilbert says everything comes out your butt crack at that moment <laughs> yeah it, it uh things can get a little bit dicey so I, I think the more that you simplify your life as far as what's happening in your head the better 
So I'm going to drop the next one to Kyle and and Jim. I'm, I'm interested to hear the contrast in this. And it kind of comes off of what Joe was just saying, understanding your equipment. Right. And I think to a point there's going to be no offense to Jim, but Kyle is going to have this mechanical mechanical engineer mind when it comes to this equipment and look at this thing and go, okay, this works like this, right? Jim is like me. It's practical use thing, right? Okay. Yeah. That kind of looks funny there, but yeah, I can shoot with the damn thing. So you guys take that one and understanding your equipment and then how Kyle more so from you, how does that affect you as an archer um, with that understanding of how the equipment is actually functioning? Yeah. Did you want me to go first? I guess I could. Uh, hey, go for so, it, man. Yeah. Thank you. For for me, like in general, uh, life is that way. Like um, I can understand things and I can groove with things better because I understand how they work. And so when I pull my boat back, I know exactly what's happening. I know what every feeling is to me. And I, uh, you know, I, as I pull back, I, I know what's going on. I know the stress is involved. I know that what's close, what's not that kind of stuff. So, um, it was interesting. I thought you were going to ask me how I prep for going hunting. Uh, my answer is I, I buy a ton of arrows because I know the brush is coming. <laughs> but, uh, and you know, it, it's interesting too, like, uh, how differently engineers look at the world is it's complicated because if I don't understand it, then I, I have to, and that's with everything. Um, you know, we're talking, it's so interesting to hear you guys talk about things because I mean, I'm not a huge hunter. Uh, if somebody said that I could go, this is blasphemy in this room, I'll get kicked out. But, uh, if I could go, if somebody said you'd go hunting for a week by yourself, like here in Indiana, you know, whitetail hunting for yourself, by yourself for a week, or you could go to the range and I could have all of my, you know, my lab radar. So I can, it's not just, the instantaneous velocity of the arrow, but I look at a hundred points of data all the way up to a hundred yards. So I do studies on arrow weight, um, veins, different veins. I've shot well over 30 different types of veins. I I'm developing my own vein profile and I've done probably 20 vein profiles that are, that I've shot to get to where I am now. It's done, but it's getting molded anyway. Uh, so I've, I've done studies like that with my lab radar, I made my own wind tunnel for arrows. So I, I could put any arrow in there. I could put any broadhead in there and it turns freely. And so I know uh, like I can get RPM measurements, one vein versus another vein versus one degree, two and a half degree, five degree, four fletch, three fletch. What's the drag? What's the drop? How does arrow weight affect, you know, velocity? How fast is it shed velocity? What's it look like? And so all those things are kind of going through my mind as I'm drawing back. And it's not, it doesn't make it as complicated as it sounds but I just know what's going on. And so I can, like, I picture, I picture it as it's going on. It's not like I'm just pulling back and doing something. I know what's all involved and what's going on with it. So, uh, the, yeah, I mean, even to hear like Joe talk, like I'm running computational fluid dynamics on my computer right now <laughs> to study the vein <laughs> profile that I made to decrease the drag of it. So my vein that's coming out is quieter than a max stealth and, has better stability than any of the other veins out there. Mathematically proven, not like, uh, you know, I, 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 I've shot five elk or something, or I, I've shot eight deer with it. Like I could prove it mathematically that it's better than this one, but that's the things that's interesting to me. Like, uh, you know, you guys talk about, uh, you don't like to fletch arrows. I love to fletch arrows. <laughs> it's what I enjoy doing. It's relaxing. I love studying how arrow flight is affected. You know, I like looking at, uh, watching the wind tunnel, you know, I, I like uh, all that stuff. So uh, for me, like uh, I've been, my, my big hunt is I go to Wisconsin once a year. Uh, I don't have access to a lot of land here in Indiana. And I honestly don't have time full-time job as a mechanical engineer and a full-time job building arrows for everybody. So uh, it's good that I, I like what I do and am focused on it because a lot of guys like you guys, you know, uh, it gives people a lot of uh, confidence when they pull the boat back to know that somebody's some nerd at somewhere in Indiana has done a lot of homework to figure out that, you know, this exact angle is the best to shoot period. You know, it's like, yeah. Would you like to hear me talk about veins for three hours? I easily could, you know, <laughs> <Garrett> <laughs> some of you guys really know the answer to that Garrett knows. And 
I definitely got a question guidance. for you though. So does your does your vein provide as good a steering in the back as the Max Stealth? And is it easier to adhere? Because I'm sold if it is. Yes. So this is this is the <laughs> material. This is not the vein. Yeah. This is the material. <laughs> and the answer is a hundred percent. And I can mathematically prove it. It's quieter than the Max Stealth. It is more stable. Steering's a complicated task uh, to discuss, and I, I don't want to dominate the podcast with the aerodynamics speak, but uh, <laughs> it is more stable and it, it than a Max Stealth on paper. If you go and shoot, it'll be exactly the same, but it's quieter than a Max Stealth. It's quieter than a Blazer. Uh, YouTube plug, but there, go to DCA Customeros uh, YouTube. The videos are horrible. They're short, but there's <laughs> good data there. So uh, check out the one with Saber on it, and you can hear the difference. Uh, like a Max Max Hunter and a Blazer have what I call as a sizzle. So as it goes past the camera, you hear a And with a Max Stealth, you hear a And hmm. honestly, like I have another video out there where I shot uh, seven different veins talking about noise. And I didn't really have a, a dog in the fight. Honestly, at the end of it, I say, I don't think vein noise makes a difference. Your bow is louder. Uh, but not to name drop, but when I was doing arrows for Donnie Vincent, it, it was, he was like, it's, they have to be quiet. They have to be quiet. And I was like, why is that? He's like, I'm out in Alaska. It's freezing cold. There's nothing out there. So every noise carries forever. And so I was thinking about that. And it's true. When you shoot your bow, that noise that your bow makes is a thump and that could get something's attention. So it's like paying attention, but it's that arrow flight. If it hears that, then that's tipping you off. And then along with that, it's like, why not? Why not make it quiet? And I honestly like how I got into building arrows. Uh, I just kind of started messing around with things and I was like, well, maybe this will work. And then it became obsession for sure. Um, like the, the veins are going to be a passion. No obsession. <laughs> Passion is when you do it. Obsession is when you wake up three or four times at night with ideas that you have to write down or you can't go back to sleep. And I'm not joking. Uh, I think about it 24 hours a day. Uh, I know more. I do more rocket science than I do mechanical engineering now. Like literally, I use programs they use to design rockets to design these veins. Not joking at all. So how, uh, how far out? How far out are are you on those? They're going to be about two months. So. Uh, like I said, I have the material now. Uh, I'm happy with it. That's what I've been doing. Like I've been uh, bending it and holding it and then checking to make sure that it's going back straight. Because that I hate that. I hate that. The vein has to be perfect. It can't be good. It has to be perfect. <laughs> so the material, you know, remembering its shape, going back to shape, being able to bond really well, bonding to itself, maybe not using a primer pin. Right. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> that's 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 why we get along my ocd brother <laughs> so kyle going going back to what i was asking you before we go oh, to yeah, the gym sorry. so when so when the numbers of the matrix are falling down the black screen right <laughs> <laughs> as you're drawn back so how does and then and, and i've i i don't know how i have never asked you that question as much as we talk how does that affect you as an archer right are you i know you kind of said it's not happening at the moment but you're going through that now does that play does that have some weird play as you're going through that or it's like okay this calculation blah 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 blah. yeah i'm hitting the mark yeah it uh i think me pulling back and knowing that when i pull back i know i've done everything right i've done my bow is set up perfectly i've shot all the arrows i've practiced i've shot my broadheads i know that this is the best arrow for the, for the job and so i it gives me that that confidence to be able to pull back and shoot. And I think a lot of people that buy my arrows feel the same way. I mean, you know, they, they look really cool. They're uh, with a wrap on them. They're very customized and all that stuff. And I think that that gives people uh, just that extra boost of confidence too. You know, these are made by somebody that's a huge nerd in Indiana again. And, you know, they, they know that I've done the math. This will work. All I have to do is put it on the pin. I don't have to worry about that. And I kind of think the same thing when I, when I pull back, I know what everything feels like. And when I put the pin on there and I know what that arrow flight's going to look like, I can picture it in my mind. And all I have to do, the, the funny thing is like, so I, in high school, I raced go-karts uh, with my dad for like five years. And I knew that the, the funny thing is about like getting nervous and stuff like that. I don't really get nervous anymore because all I think in my head is just do it right. And it's done. And so if you have the tools and you, 
like you guys have said, you put in the time, you, your repetition, your consistency, it's all about consistency, your anchor, your everything, your arrows. Um, if you have that consistency and you do it right, it's going to happen. And that's all I do. So uh, I know that, you know, I let it go. I know exactly what that arrow flight's going to look like. I know exactly where it's going to hit. And uh, I, I don't get nervous about it. So. So Jim, that take, answer? yeah, that was perfect, man. So let, <laughs> let's uh, Jim take it, you know, the same one. Um, and this is, in my opinion, the contrast of the matrix over there, um, you know, understanding <laughs> your equipment. Yeah, man. Uh, he's uh, Kyle's talking about like wind tunnels and shit. I, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> that was like I, opening I for people, Aerosmith, I, right? I tell people I'm not smart. I'm just good at, very specific things. I am not a smart guy though. No, no, that, actually you are. And, and that's, I think that's part of the contract is it contrasts is, is guys like me need guys like you. Right. Because I, I, I don't do the math on any of that. I, I just don't. I, I go, especially back in the day. I mean, I used to go elk hunting with, with wall Walmart arrows and I'm not kidding you. And uh, yeah. I just didn't think about that kind of stuff. I'd take them out and I'd shoot them and see where they were going. And, and um, it's funny in my day job, we have to take these personality tests and, and, you know, there's, there's like four spectrums and there's like this driver spectrum that I fall under. And then there's like this real analytical engineer type uh, detail oriented kind of spectrum like th that you would fall under. Right. And, and I think that everybody has those kind of uh, personality traits and, and what they need to do is understand what personal personality trait they are. And, and focus on the strength of that personality trait, because I, I know that I am not going to sit down and engineer arrows. I, I just, I know that that's not going to happen for me. Not, uh, I don't, I, I have a hard time cutting my toenails. So when you're talking about, <laughs> you know, building arrows, it, it's, it's, that's it's a whole different thing. And so, uh, the, the contrast with that is, is, Every hunter, no matter what kind of personality trait they fall under, whether they're like Kyle, where they're they're super engineer focused and, and they're super analytical about things, or they're more like me, who is, you know, just kind of dumb and walks into walls, right? It, it is a, a situation that uh, you have to know your strength. And practice and the, and the contrast in, in knowing your gear is that's that's what the contrast is. I think all of us, no matter what personality trait we are, if we're serious about hunting, we know our gear, we practice, we work at it, uh, we know how it's going to perform. And sometimes, you know, it's not, I, I don't think anything is foolproof. I don't, I don't care how great the arrows are and how great your bow is. I, I don't think everything, everything is 100%, 100% of the time. Uh, sure. I've had great equipment fail me. I've had really bad equipment uh, outperform really expensive equipment. And, and, and so it's just a, it's, it's a matter of, of knowing where those fail points are and, and where your personal weaknesses are, uh, depending on whether or not it's a, you know, a physical thing or a, 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 just a personality thing. So, um, I don't know if that answered your question guy, but that's, that's kind of what comes to mind when, when, uh, we're talking along these lines. No, it, it, it did for me. So, Caesar, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with you on this one, right? And I think this will be interesting. And and anyone that wants to chime in on this, right, just go ahead and chime in. When we're talking about, and Garrett hit on this, right? But I want I want your honest perspective, not influenced by anything you've heard, right? What what have you done? How did you look at going into the pig hunt? You and I have talked, so I kind of know the answer. And then we had discussions going into deer season, and then our trip to Colorado for elk when to be ready, right? When to be ready for season. If there's that level of tinkering, if that, that new gear presents itself, uh, when to be ready. And we're talking archery, not fitness. I mean, so you're, are you, is your question, how do you know when you're ready to go out? To well, we, no, we'll talk about that too. I was going to direct that question more to Chad. Um, but I want you to talk about when to be ready. When should you be ready if if your season starts, our A zone starts oh. in in July? Right. When should you be woods ready? I'm ready to send that broadhead. And I want you to talk about your experience because there's going to be some contrast there to what the other guys have said mm -hmm. um, and some of the vets on on this. I mean, well, the I mean, I, I the really the answer is. You should always be ready. I don't know how that the re the reality of that is for most of us in regards to like 
you know, if we have day jobs and, you know, life at home and things like that, that may get in the way of that. But uh, I mean, for me personally, um, you mentioned the pig hunt I went on last year. That was the first hunt I did. And, you know, I, I spent, well, I always shoot year round, uh, sometimes more than others, but I always shoot. And when I was, when I found out that I was going to do the pig hunt or when I kind of committed to going, you know, I was shooting all the time at home. Like I would, before work, I would go to the range and shoot and then I'd go to work and then I'd come home and then I do that five days a week. And then I go to the range on the weekends. And then, and then, uh, you know, in regards to like, uh, the arrows and what I decided to shoot, that started to get, I started to get more in, or, or I started to think about more of maybe variety, right? Cause I shot a certain type of arrow when uh, I did the pig hunt. And then when I went on the deer hunt, I shot a different type of arrow. And that was just cause I don't know, I wanted to try something new. And then, I mean, I, I guess the, I don't want to be long winded, but pretty much I think at the end of the day, you, you, you gotta be able to put the, the arrow in the mark and, and, you know, however you, whatever you need to do to get to that, that's what you need to do for the, for our elk hunt. I was really worried about that. Cause I don't know. I, you know, that's a big deal for one. I wasn't going to, I wasn't sure if I was even going to get an opportunity. And if I did, I didn't want to blow that. So, so I'm going to, really so that. let me, I'm going to, I'm going to take it a little bit here and I want Chad to respond to this. So, so Caesar was at the range and, and Caesar and I met at the range. What do you think? Two and a half years ago. Uh, somewhere yeah, something in like there. That. Mm -hmm. And, and this guy can shoot. Like I said, I mean, he is a phenomenal archer. Um, and I don't care who you put him next to the guy. Well, yeah, we can get into that, but you know, in this room here, yeah. this guy could shoot. <laughs> um, but when I said, hey, you know, we're talking, I'm like, dude, just go to Colorado with us, right? Just, you know, buy mm -hmm. the tag. Or if you just want to tag tag along, come on. You know, I don't know if I, even with the pig hunt, even with our, our early season archery deer, I don't know if I'm ready. And I'm like, dude, you've been shooting your bow for four years, right? For mm -hmm. four years, you're dialing oh, in. See. And I'm watching this guy, die. I mean, literally, he's, he's dropping dimes, right? Literal dimes out at 80 yards with me, right? Without, <laughs> without flinching. And as I'm fatiguing, right, and I'm like, man, I'm gonna take a break. This dude is still dropping dimes out at 80 yards, and it's just like, what, what are you waiting on, right? I think I understand. I mean, yeah. So uh, I waited f four years before I went out to hunt because I wanted to make sure that I was going to be ethical. That was my biggest. Uh, I mean, that was just, responsible. Yeah, yeah and, absolutely. And, you know, we. The, I know of some other people that you know, hunt with a bow with only shooting it for like a month. And I mean, that's their prerogative for me personally. Like I have, I, I knew when I started that I was going to make sure I was proficient in this before I went out and took an animal. And, you know, last year that pig hunt, I shot that pig and I double lunged them. So, I mean, I, I don't know if that's a, a testament to that, but, you know, after that, I felt very uh, uh, confident in myself. And I mean, granted, you know, it, different animals, you know, they're, they're all different to each other in regards to, 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 I mean, you go into like an elk hunt, right? That's not shooting a pig, you know? So it's, you know, there's, there's definitely the high, the, the stakes are higher. So is it, it's still alive, right? I'll be yeah, a, a, a I mean, 1100 the, pound animal versus a 200 pound animal. Think about the opportunities. Like you, you know, those come few and far between, especially for you and I that don't go, I mean, for, for me personally, I only been out once. And I don't know when potentially I'm going to go again, you know, and if, I don't know, it's, it's just one of those things where if you need to make it happen, it needs to happen or you need to be able to make it happen. So Chad, with that, what with your, you know, with, with backcountry rookies and everything, um, you get a lot of folks that are new into it. Are, do you, what do you tell them when they're in that position, right? When they're like, Hey, I've been shooting my bow for, you know, two years, or I should, I've been shooting a bow for a year. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with Caesar's decision to hold off, but what do you tell those folks? How do you advance their game um, so that they're ready to go and get into the woods? Yeah, I think the the first thing that they really need to do is make sure their TikTok account and Instagram account, everything's <laughs> ready to go, so they it didn't can happen put if out you don't. <laughs> sweet dance videos. 
Um, no, I tell people all the time, just go, just get out and do it because you can sit at that range all day, every day, and you can drop those 80 yard bombs and you can do whatever, <laughs> but until you get out there and you, you hit that mountain, none of that woodsmanship that we've been talking about on here, none of that happens. And you don't, you don't ever learn how to do any of it. You can, we could argue. I mean, we, we could talk about how fun it is. You, um, Kyle, you're down, you're over there in Indiana. I grew up in Indiana. I know it's fun to sit in a tree stand, right? And I know it's fun to shoot whitetails out of a tree stand, but it, it, there's just nothing like the, the, the lessons that you learn at 10,000 feet when you're climbing deadfall and you're just absolutely getting hammered out there. And I, I think that you just have to go. That's how you know when you're ready, right? When you put the gas in the truck and you go down the road and you hit the woods. If you're not, and I tell people this a lot, I talk about it a lot on the podcast. If you don't think that you're ready to, to engage at an animal, shoot an animal, then don't buy the tag. Go with your buddies that year and just learn woodsmanship. Learn how to be in the woods. A lot of these guys that are coming out from, from out east have never slept in a tent at 8,000 feet or 10,000 feet. And then all of a sudden, because of that sweet TikTok account or whatever it is out there, these dudes are thinking they're going to hit the mountains and go 10 miles deep and they're going to stay 10 days. And they've never even slept outside in the backyard. So I, I think there's, there's so much to learn just in getting outside and going out and just being, being part of it. Being I, part do, of it. I do want to say that I, I, I didn't, I would have gone out sooner, but, uh, the, um, the environment that I was in didn't harbor that. So in other words, uh, I don't have any friends that hunt other than guy. And I met guy at the range. So I was trying to figure out how to go and like, I knew I wanted to get my license and I kind of made all those decisions and went through all of that on my own. And then when I finally met guy and he was like, Hey, you want to tag along? Yes. Yeah. And there's a lot of really good uh, organizations out there for mentorship, right? That teach people how to, to get out there and do it. Um, I, there's, there's a lot of people that have, get people involved or jump on elk addicts or, or whatever self promotion, oh, yeah. right? We have the backcountry rookies nation and I, there's so many people that go in backcountry rookies nation on Facebook and they say, Hey man, I don't know where to start. I don't even have a hunting partner. I'm thinking about going solo for my first year, right? Because they don't have that person to go. And it's amazing to me how many people will raise their hand and say, Hey, come sit in my camp, man. Come sit around the same. Gerald, you say these kind of things all the time. Hey, come sit at our campfire, right? Welcome to the elk camp. And I, I think that there's a, there's a lot to be said, nothing against you, Caesar. I, I don't, I'm not saying anything. I don't know you. I don't know anything about you, but um, a lot of people are scared to ask, right? I want to go hunting. Where do I start? You did the right thing. You picked up a bow and you went to the archery range. When you want to meet people that go hunting, where do you go? Right. You, you, you go to the shooting range, you go to the archery range, you go somewhere where you're going to be involved in those like-minded people. Um, I don't typically look for hunting partners at Starbucks, right? It's just not how that works. <laughs> right. so you, you, I mean, they're probably there, but it's just not <laughs> the environment where you're going to talk about those kind of things. So I, I think that there's a, there's a way to get into it, right? There's a way to, to be involved. And I think that's kind of where we got really lucky and we hit a mark where we, we are able to kind of educate people through the backcountry rookies. It's, it's appropriately named, right? We're out there as an educational piece for people to, to go and, and just listen and try to learn something we've had. I mean, every show we try to be somewhat educational. I don't know if we are or not, but we try. So I'm going to, I'm going to flip us real quick. Right. Because I, and I think Caesar and I have had this conversation and I'm, I'm going to just peel us back into archery a little bit because there's a lot, there's a lot to talk about with it. Right. And we can go through all this, but the one thing I do want to point out as we're into our hour and 45 minutes here. Um, so I'll try and speed us up. If anybody needs to drop off, I understand totally. Um, is that with everything that's been said, right. Is, is, get behind your equipment, spend time behind your equipment. Doesn't matter if it's, you know, if it's new, if it's old, if it's somewhere in between, get behind the equipment. So we're going to hold off, Kyle, you're going to go last on this. Um, 
and I don't care who chimes in first, I want to talk about the importance of trajectory in archery. I don't really hear it talked about. It's something that I actually practice. Um, and I think it's, in my opinion, it's hugely important. I'm sure Garrett has to practice his, in his Rosie Woods. If Mike's hunting North Idaho, he's having to deal with it. Jim's having to deal with it. So I'd like to talk about trajectory. Um, who wants to take the first stab? Uh, what is trajectory exactly? <laughs> there, there it goes right there. there it goes. I'll just give you a it's a squared. Glad plus. there's an engineer in here. That made it easy. Yeah. That's where I call Kyle. Well, okay. So the reason <laughs> the reason I bring it up, right, is is because and, and I and I'm sure that we've all at some point have fallen victim to the the speed thing when it comes to bows, right? And we have this, we have this, you know, this super fast bow, and or we have this, you know. 84 pounder and you know i want to put this much weight on it and i got you know this 80 pound bow that's shooting you know an arc like this now because i want a 620 and no no offense to anyone's weights or anything like that um but trajectory <laughs> is huge for me i have to know what my bow is going to do i have to know in some of my country that i can thread that needle if it's this big at this distance i know where my arrow is going to be in that line of sight right and i'm not saying i'm a badass archer i'm a decent archer uh, <laughs> i think it's an important aspect of what we do and i just don't hear the conversation when we hear speed and arrow weights and things like that in terms of trajectory so there's there, there's two things I want to touch on real quick, and and I, I I've had you know conversations about this, and 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 I can't remember who talked about it earlier, but FOC, I mean FOC right now is a huge thing, and you have people that you you can't have enough FOC, and, and I'm looking at it going, okay, great, you you have all this FOC, but what are you doing on the back end? What what are you doing to make sure your arrow stays straight? You have all this FOC up front, you have a crosswind, and your back end is shifting. When your arrow hits the target, it's no longer in line. You're losing kinetic energy. You're losing penetration through that because instead of that staying in that same trajectory, same plane, and it doesn't matter if you're shooting on a flat line or if you have a little bit of arc to your arrow it's how your arrow is when it hits the target is it staying straight to continue to drive through or is your back end so light that the wind's drifting it and now you're off angle a little bit and you lose all of that penetration and momentum so the other thing is understanding your equipment and garrett did a great video um God, Garrett, when, was that two years ago when you did about shooting through windows in the brush and you talked about how to use your pins to make sure yeah. that your arrows were That's gonna actually go? what I was going to bring up. And yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. It's a great video. I, I mean, anybody that's new, it's like you want to know what your arrow is going to do. You want to know if you can make it through that window. Garrett did a great job on this video of explaining it and going, if you have a small window to shoot through, you, you know, look at this. So, but again, understanding your trajectory and, and all of that stuff and how your arrow is going to go through that. And again, it's understanding and knowing your equipment and what's going to happen there. So Garrett, take it away since Mike dropped that video and then dropped the video. Uh, so if folks want to check it out. I, I don't even know what I called it. <laughs> so I'll look it for it and put it in. The, it was in a while link. ago. I've got over a hundred videos on there now. Um, so uh, long story short, first, I, I have something written down here. And guy, this is a uh, shout out to you, brother, for taking, and I don't mean this anything against Caesar, but thanks for taking a risk on somebody you didn't know. Um, I've, I've done that a few times. It's bit me in the ass. And uh, I think if anybody that's tried it multiple times, you know, they've probably been bit. Um, and it sounds like Caesar's working out and he's on, you know, I love where he's at. So thank you for expanding the sport and bringing somebody in and especially somebody with, you know, like Caesar. Um, good job on that. Absolutely, but, man. Appreciate that. Um, so trajectory, uh, that's a whole two hour podcast in itself, to Understood. be honest with you. So <laughs> Mike brought up FOC and I just start laughing because the more, the more I hunt and the more I, I kill, the more I talk to these guys that are absolute just killers in every sense of the word. Um, they don't even know what their FOCs are. 
<laughs> yeah. Right. So um, I used to measure that stuff. I still measure that stuff because that's just who I am. But, um, you know, I've been shooting 14% the last few years. I think uh, a standard axis, you know, a 28 inch standard axis, 100 to 125 grain tip, you're about, you know, with blazer veins, you're about a 10% FOC on that um, with a 9.5, you know, 349.5 GPI. So, I mean, that's, that's getting a lot of kill. That's probably the number one arrow out there that kills stuff is, around here at least is an axis 340. That's what I shot my pig with. Yeah. Three, an axis 340. Most guys throw a hundred grain tip on there. And the ones that I can convince to throw 125 grain tip on there might be shooting 10%. Most of them are shooting about a nine to 9.5% FOC. And they're all going, you know, I, I, I was shooting a PSE Carol intruder when I started and I was getting pass throughs at 70 yards with a 9% FOC, 10% FOC arrow shooting 260 right at deer. So, um, that's a whole story that I think is, is, um, it's an acronym. It's effing overcomplicated and you just, you, you just need to build, uh, you just need to build a good arrow setup and the FOC will be there. I'm going to leave it at that, uh, for speed. Um, for, for me personally, speed is, I, I like the, the tuning, the tunability of an arrow going about 280. Um, I've since backed it down since I've been shooting about 500 ish grains. I've shoot 40 right now, about 271 feet per second. And I, um, to explain what Mike brought up the video, if you want to know if you're going to hit a tree or a limb, um, you have pins, probably 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, whatever it may be. Um, you can range that obstacle preferably before the animals there, right? A little bit of foresight goes a long ways. And when you failed as much as I have, you find eventually ways to succeed. <laughs> you start ranging these things that you know are going to be an issue. And so if I have a limb that's at 40 yards and I draw back before that animal's there, right? I draw back and I'm aiming at 50 yards where I think he's going to come out and my pin at 40 is on that limb. I'm going to smack that limb, right? So you can, with a little bit of foresight and planning and, and, and building your own failures, you can start to, you know, find successes in scenarios where you would have hit that branch. And if you're not in the off season shooting through brush, viney maple here, um, you know, there's cedar boughs, fir boughs, whatever it is. I shot through about a cell phone cord, um, maybe a little bit bigger than a cell phone cord uh, of a limb, but I had shot through limbs, right? And I chopped that limb off and I took two limbs that I'd chopped off in a video and I smoked that bullet 17 yards. And I had two limbs that were, you know, they were smaller than my finger here, about the size of that pen, but I had chopped those things off because I had chopped those things off on the way to my Reinhardt, you know, 15 times before season, resharpen the broadheads. And those are the ones in my quiver. So um, trajectory is shoot is in my opinion on trajectory to, to sum this thing up, not to steal it from everybody, but um, shoot as heavy as you're happy with the trajectory. And so for me, that is, um, you know, the happy medium for any, everybody's different, but for me, I like to shoot no less than 260, just because it's just getting a little slow for what I like, preferably stick around 270 to 280. And if I'm shooting something, maybe like an antelope, I might kick, you know, I might build a special arrow for 290, but honestly, I'll probably just stick with a 275 grain arrow. When you drop down 20 feet per second and you shoot that for a year, that, that bull I killed at 81 yards two years ago, he, did, he didn't know any better. I mean, he didn't know my arrow wasn't shooting 280, right? And I didn't miss that trajectory. <laughs> I mean, he, he, I didn't miss it. It was out in the middle of a unit. So, um, but I will say if you're shooting stuff like in the coast, shooting a little bit faster is nice. If you're shooting second growth, uh, you know, 30, 40 year old timber, you're having a lot of these, um, you know, trees that the, the, the shooting lanes close up, the higher you get, that is, that is nice to have. So, um, that's my spill is shoot as, is, is fat or shoot as heavy as you can. As long as you're happy with the trajectory, build a good arrow, the FS, FOC will be there and, uh, momentum, um, to me, momentum over KE is, is another one of my opinions, but that's, uh, that's in a whole nother podcast. Go ahead, Jojo. So, you know, um, again, it's a failure thing and I've seen a lot of people that, and it's, again, it just all goes back to knowing your equipment, man. It, it's, it's about that equipment being an extension of you knowing what is, what it's going to do. And see, I think a lot of people are, 
that think they're sometimes hunter ready because they're range ready, they're backyard rock star ready, but they haven't necessarily done the things to challenge whether they are hunter ready. They haven't challenged themselves with gear on. They haven't challenged themselves in bad conditions with wind coming from the left, wind coming from the right, so that they know how they react to that. And they haven't done it by trying to poke through areas where you, you know, you might not think you can poke through. And I, I've seen guys like, uh, you, I love it in 3D shoots when they have the kill covered halfway there or three quarters there so that you're not seeing the kill. And, you know, so many guys that will shoot over the back of an animal because, you know, they're thinking so much about instead of their spot that they're shooting, they're thinking about the object itself or or they'll think about it so much that they'll hit that object instead of realizing that you know with what i shoot if that thing is covering the kill area i still aim at the kill because i'm going to go over and drop right in and it's going to be a dead critter so uh that's where i think knowing your trajectory i i don't call it trajectory i just go knowing what your weapon is going to do and uh if, if you do that, if you have shot it enough and you've gotten out there, you've shot off your knees, you've shot sitting down, you've shot leaning, you know, think about all of those things that you are going to do in the field. And when you asked about how do you know if you're hunter ready, look, if I have, if I have any question in my mind, if I have any doubt in my mind about where I'm shooting right now, and, and I don't mean as far as, you know, where I'm pegging but if there's anything feeling a little bit off and i go out there i'm not ready you know i mean that's going to rock your confidence and guys it all comes down to confidence when you're hunting it all comes down and that confidence comes from all of that preparation you know it comes from all of that putting yourself in the uncomfortable positions to get comfortable you know you be ready if you're you know if your uh peep sight twists on you be ready you know if uh all of a sudden you go to you know uh, get that kisser button in and it's not there what are you going to do you know are you going to freak out well you still have another point of contact right you just stay right in your game because you practice that so uh a trajectory is huge in that it it opens your ability to know what you're going to do to make a shot, whether it's, you know, whether it's 20 yards, whether it's 30 yards, whether it's 70 yards out there. You know, you might be shooting over top of something, you know, and underneath something else that's there. You know, you, you just understand that because you've done it so much. I, I just think the whole thing is about comfort knowing knowledge and and this is just the shooting part man i mean <laughs> we've talked about gear all this time and we're talking about you know investing in knowing that piece of equipment and i think i think you can give some guys a dog on spear and they could get out there and kill an elk because <laughs> They know how to get up on an animal. You know, they understand the animal. They understand the environment. Their woodsmanship is so good. You know, they, they just have, uh, they have that knowledge factor. They have improved themselves as a hunter. It, you know, I, I can hand any of you a hammer and say, go build a house, right? But if you don't know where to start and you don't know how to put all that together, you can have the best equipment in the world. You know, I can be shooting Kyle's arrow. And I could be shooting it on Caesar's bow that I know that guy's going to produce a best arrow. He's going to have that bow tuned in. That's just the type of guys they are. They're passionate about that. But it doesn't matter if I have not worked with my equipment because now I even the equipment might be great, but I become the failure point, right? So, you know, I, I think your trajectory, um, I, you know, as far as whatever that weight's going to be, you know, I I could not tell you what grain I shoot. I have no clue. You know, I I know um, that my arrows punch the way I want them. I know I'm shooting a 125 head on there. 
Um, I shoot 70 pound pole and I shot a bull this year at 60 yards. Couldn't find the arrow. I mean, it just zip, zip. You know, I do know that I'm going to be mid body three to four inches back behind that crease and I'm going to get two lungs and I'm going to put that critter down. So, I mean, again, I'm taking it, I'm taking it a little bit further. I just think we spend so much time worrying about the equipment. We don't spend enough time on preparing the hunter part. Bingo. Okay. So I'm going to, and and just because Kyle, yeah, we said totally. we said trajectory. I want Kyle to touch in on trajectory, but I'm going to spin off of what Joe just said, and I got something for uh, for Chad and Jim, and then whoever else chimes in after that. Do you want me to go now? Yes, sir. <laughs> okay. So you guys have seen me on the whole time. <laughs> the Matrix, buddy. <laughs> Those are the conversations that I have. Uh, uh, I'm a very plain person, but you guys touched on a lot of things. I just want to touch on what Joe said, which is extremely important. And people ask me, how can I shoot better? How can I shoot better? You could shoot more and you will shoot better. It's it's a good example of it is a basketball player. You give you know an excellent basketball player, an excellent shooter, a ball and they know they don't say how hard do you, how hard, how much force do you put on that ball? I shoot it and I know where it goes. It's like your equipment and I can, I'll get into kind of what I do. That's a little bit different, but like with Joe, he knows his equipment. He doesn't, you know, it's like knowing your best friend and calling him by his nickname his entire life and not knowing his name. You don't care. You know, my, my friend from college is digs and I call his house and like his digs there. And she's like, who? And I'm like, Mike, you know, <laughs> I had to think of his first name, but it's, it's knowing your equipment, knowing when you release that ball, that you know what that trajectory is going to look like, you know how it's going to fly. That's the important thing. I think with it, uh, I, and there's uh, FOC as a whole, mm, we're going to get back on, on that one guy. When my veins come out, uh, guy and Garrett, I want to be on to talk a lot about stuff. I, I have talked to people uh, that have called about arrows. I, I've talked to them about FOC for like an hour and a half. I don't even know if they were still on the phone when I got done. But there's a lot of misconceptions with that. It's really, <laughs> it's really, 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 really bad. Most important thing that you can do is have an arrow that's flying true. It's not too weak. It's not too stiff or to be unforgiving. Um, uh, Michael, you talked about the, the, the tail end whipping around and stuff. The most important thing, though, is uh, with trajectory and arrow spine and getting that correct stiffness, when that arrow hits, if it's flying at whatever trajectory it's coming in, this way or this way or this way, if that arrow is slightly bent, so it's flexing too much, when it hits something, that center of gravity, if it's offline of of the trajectory that's coming in, it's going to do this and bend up. And arrows bend like crazy. So when it hits something, automatically you're losing that trajectory because the momentum, that center gravity is going out of line with the arrow. As that goes in, you're basically trying to drive like a bent nail into an animal. When it gets in there too, it's going to start curving in the animal and it doesn't take a lot to lose. It doesn't take a lot to lose a lot of that energy. So what I do as far as trajectory and weight and FOC and all that stuff um, I look at it all. It's a three-legged stool, but the, the most important thing that I do is figure out the exact stiffness of the spine based on the, the spine of the arrow, the length of the arrow, the weight I put in the front, all that stuff. I, I balance the arrow with that. Uh, that's the most important thing to me. FOC, like Garrett was saying, if you build a good arrow, it's going to solve itself. I try to keep it I try to keep it above 12, but if it's 10, it's not that big of a deal. Uh, it's it's having it in front of it. And just in rocketry, you have your center of gravity first, and then you have your, your center of pressure behind it and knowing where all that stuff is at and being able to optimize that stuff. That's more important than knowing, you know, the center of the arrow, the arrow doesn't care where its center is when it's flying. It's not a point that affects the dynamics of how it flies. But uh, like with me, with my builds and all that stuff and figuring out the trajectory, I have a way to estimate it. <laughs> sit back. I have a way to estimate the potential energy of your bow. And so when you draw your bow back, you're actually storing potential energy in that bow. When you push your release or let go with your fingers, Joe, uh, you release that potential energy into that arrow. So you have a fixed amount of potential energy based on your setup. And that's why I ask people about their IBO and their drawing, their draw weight, what bow they're shooting, all that stuff. I take all that into account. 
and figure out, estimate the potential energy you have. And then I figure out how to optimize that potential energy to kinetic energy of the arrow transfer. I'm not big on kinetic energy either, but it's a way for me to make sure that I'm getting as much energy as I can behind that arrow and getting all that weight transferred. If you don't transfer all that potential energy into kinetic energy, you hear people at the range and it's like, bang, that energy goes into something. It goes into the vibration of the arrow or the bow. And so it, that's what all the noise you hear. If you have too heavy of an arrow on there, uh, you know, you're, you're not getting all of the, like the trajectory that you can with it. And usually you're leaving a little bit on the table. Um, I'm not like a super heavy arrow kind of guy. It's like, uh, you know, somebody mentioned 270 and 280 is a good number. And I ask people, how far do you shoot? That's on my form for my website. It's how far do you shoot? The reason I ask that is because guys out West shoot further than guys in Indiana. If I shoot, if I shoot 80 yards in an animal, I have to go through three trees to get there. But out West, <laughs> that might be a second shot, you know? Uh, so out West, you need a faster arrow, but I look at that, how much potential energy do you have? And then how can we get there? So it's like, you know, you can say, I want to shoot 150 yards and I'll say, we got to have a conversation about that. You know, with your setup, you're looking about this range. If you want to change that, here's some things you could do, you know, uh, but you don't need to shoot super fast. You need to have a good trajectory. I think 270 or 260 is good because that way, if you're 30 yards out or 35 yards out, you know, it, it keeps you from dropping too much. Also, if you're shooting through obstacles, it gives you a flat enough trajectory to be able to hit windows and, and not have to, you know, catch two or three feet of, of drop. Um, like I shoot, uh, my arrow is 450 grains. I know from all my testing with arrow weights and stuff like that, how fast it will shed velocity. It'll shed roughly 35 feet per second per second. That's the deceleration of my arrow at hundred yards. So for every second that it's in the air, it's going to lose 35 feet per second. But if you go heavier, then you shed less weight, but your overall velocity could be lower because you start lower, you lose less but you uh, start with less. So to sum it up, yeah, shoot a, shoot a good trajectory. <laughs> <laughs> I got a question for you. Have yeah. you, have you, look at and, Michael, and look at Michael. <laughs> he didn't have pants on. <laughs> <laughs> Listening to you talk here and me being a tester kind of guy, I'm thinking you, you gave me inspiration to test um, the impact paradox and what would be the perfect FOC to get the best impact paradox when it actually hits an animal too. Cause if you're way too low of an, I built 5% FOC zero. 5% FOC arrows just for fun. Um, but your impact paradox is absolutely going to suck. So what have you tested anything there or is there a good FOC to get the maximum amount of, um, or the least amount of impact paradox? What do you mean by impact paradox? So the, the flex of the arrow as it hits the animal. That's or, just or ba- built into the, the flex of, so what I look at is the dynamic spine versus the static spine. Mm-hmm. And so static spine being, you know, if your arrow says 300 on it, if your arrow says 300 on it, these are 400, but if it says 300 or 400, you know, this is for everybody else. Garrett knows this. You put two pins, 28 inches apart, and then you, you put a two pound, roughly two pound weight in the middle of it. And it'll deflect, you know, 0.300. This is a 400. This is actually, uh, Aaron Snyder's wife's arrows, but, uh, it'll deflect that much. The dynamic spine is when you hit that release and it pushes on that. So when your string starts pushing on that arrow, your arrow doesn't want to move initially. And the things that affect that are the weight of the arrow and the weight at the point of the arrow. So as you try to push it, I tell people, I have said this on the couple podcasts, but if you try to push a a bowling ball with a wet, with a like pool noodle, you can't do it. It'll fold up. (laughs) If you try to push a baseball, you could do that. And that's the same thing that's affecting the spine of the arrow. So for me, what I've seen is having a a true flight with an arrow. So having it I kind of have a rough idea of the spine that I want. Actually, I have a very good idea of the spine that I want to get perfect flight. And if your arrow is flying good and you have good, if you have good uh, groupings with your arrows, consistent groupings with your arrows and tight groupings with your arrows, then it's not flexing too much. Because if it's flexing too much, what it's doing in flight is doing this and it's also rotating. So you can actually see, you know, doing this and it'll be grouping big. That means that you're getting too much flex with that arrow as it's going. It's wandering. So it's going this way, it's going down. And then when it rotates and it goes out and then it goes up and then it goes out and then they all hit and you get a big, you know, shotgun group. 
uh, it's easy to see people that have arrows that are overspined versus underspined because if you shoot like a, a seriously underspined arrow at a distance where you can get a decent grouping for everybody, that's different. But you know, if you could shoot, you know, it's 60 is kind of your range, shoot that then see where you can get good groups and bad groups. And people that shoot weak arrows get shotgun patterns that are just scattered. If people that shoot too heavy of a spine of an arrow uh, have a good group and then they'll have like one outlier and it won't be a consistent arrow. If you mark your arrows and like you go out and you start shooting and you're like, okay, number three is always out. Then uh, you're, you know, get a better arrow builder. But the <laughs> DCA customer arrows always spine aligned. Um, but the, you know, you can see which which groups are what. And I've caught people. I've been like, you know, walking out to the range. I don't talk to anybody unless they ask for advice or if we're just talking and they ask a question because I, I don't like to be that guy. But I can watch people shoot and be like, I know what. I know it. I know what's wrong with that dude. I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to say anything, but uh, <laughs> I have a good idea that and there's just new guys there and you need some time to, to go shoot and get comfortable with it. And you don't need somebody telling you what you're doing wrong all the time. Sometimes you just got to get into it and keep doing it and get that repetition down and find your flow, you know, find your, your jump shot, you know, get your Jim Furyk swing out and, and make it weird and make it work. You know uh, it's consistency. Consistency is a hundred percent the key. And that's why, with my arrows, you know, the heaviest to the lightest arrow, I built some for the catch and deers guys. I built, uh, 48 arrows and, uh, two dozen of them were black Eagle renegades. And the difference between the heaviest arrow and lightest arrow in 24 arrows was 1.6 grains. And that's fully built and spinal line and everything like that. So they're deadly consistent. And so getting that consistency, but like Joe was saying, and like Michael was saying, if you're not consistent with your shot placement and your anchor and you're not consistent and you're not doing the same thing over and over and over, it doesn't matter. You know, you're, you, you have a really nice car that you can't drive. <laughs> so well. getting behind the wheel, driving it is key. So you need uh, a t-shirt, Kyle, you need a t-shirt that says arrow guy on the back and on the front. It says, ask me, I know what's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> the rain shirt. Yeah. So my buddy, Josh Dud got me a shirt that says arrow wizard. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'm going to, and another one that, that you hear a lot, right? So, you know, as we, as we have that animal, in front of us, uh, some of us are jitterers. Some of us get uh, respirations that uh, appear to be hyperventilation. That's me, right? It's at draw, I don't care what it is, man. Everything from from here to my to my anchor points and everything is rock solid, man. My respirations go flipping crazy. I've seen guys like this jittering at draw. I don't, Jim, I'm not sure. I can't see you. So I'm not sure if you're sitting there or if it's just your, uh, your logo there. <laughs> so I want, uh, I want Chad and, and Jim to talk about checking the fever. We'll call it. How do you guys control the fever? Yeah, I'll, I can go first on that. I, so I don't really have that fever. I've, man, I've been put in way worse situations than having an animal put in front of me. And, and, and there's like, I, I, none of that stuff really bothers me. So I, I don't get it. I don't know that I've ever been super shaky at, at full draw. Um, it's not really a thing. I think practice and just being proficient with your, you know, and, and comfortable with your entire process, shot process. I mean, that's got to be a key, but. I don't know. Is it even possible to shake that if you if you're a nervous shooter like that? Is that I don't I don't is it know possible that it's, to shake it. I think there's a hit of adrenaline that comes, and controlling that hit of adrenaline is you know to each their own. Some guys are great at it. like for me, it's respirations. But yeah. you put me behind a rifle, and I'm the shaky guy, right? Yeah. But, I, but I'm steady shot, you know. So I think that hit of adrenaline is what does it. I just like, yeah, you probably. know, I just eat up having that animal in the sights, but you know, cool hand Luke over here. I shouldn't even ask him the damn question. <laughs> yeah. I'm not, I'm not trying to say that. I'm just, what I'm, I guess I don't, I don't know. There's been a lot, a lot of training that's gone on and put, put in a lot of real life situations right. that like, I'm not really too that elk's not shooting back. So I'm not that concerned about it. You know, <laughs> um, I, I, yeah, yeah. 
I, I don't know. Maybe Jim's maybe Jim's got Jim, something better Jim's for you. Jim's been sir. dumping off here and there. Washington or uh, Idaho has a really bad signal for some reason. I'll ask the question hey, to everybody I, else because I, I, is there is there some it, like for the guys that do have that buck fever or bull fever or whatever you want to call it? Is there anything that you can do in this? I would think it would be more like a worse thing in the shot itself. I've been a little shaky before I've drawn my bow back, but when you draw back here in that moment, I'm pretty calm and collected. Is there something you do to calm yourself down in the shot? Something that I've done uh, before I went on my, one of my hunts, like, you know, I was going out with a bunch of guys that I didn't really know that well at the, at the beginning. I'm really good friends with them now, but um, I would go to the range and luckily my range has a lot of different targets. So they have, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. And, um, I would go and I would stand at like the, the 20 I'd have, you know, like a, a target set at 10, my own target. And then I'd have different ones out there. And what I would do is just kind of in my head, I would draw back and then 20, and then I would turn and shoot at 20. And then I, I'd, I'd draw back. And as I was drawing back, I would pick my next one and then I would turn and I would shoot at that one. And it was, uh, trying to get it as quick as I can and, and how fast I could hit it. And so it was again, knowing your pins and practicing with your pins that way, when you're put in that stressful situation, uh, you know, you're, it's at 30, that's it. You know, that's what you've been practicing. And a lot of guys that are in the, uh, the military, I think they do that as well. Uh, you know, putting, putting yourself in stressful situations, you know, doing push ups and that kind of stuff. And your, your arms and legs, uh, I race mountain bikes too. And your arms and legs would just go, you know, they'd hit the gun and your body would just turn to jello, man. I mean, it was so weird and your breathing would just go away. And, but once you got going, it, it would it would be easier. But I think just trying to put yourself in those stressful situations so that when you're put in that, you're said, you know, to 30, you know what to do. It's like muscle memory kind of thing. You're automatically into it. Yeah. That's right. something I do at the range a lot too, is when I'm sh- practicing and I'm shooting, I'll do 20 or 30 push-ups, or I'll do a hundred yard dash to get that yeah. elevated heart rate. And, to, and, and I think if you practice it, a lot of people don't even think about it, but if you practice getting your breathing under control and you practice muscle fatigue and drawing at muscle fatigue, there, there's, I don't know. It's all muscle memory. The more you do it, the more you're going to be used to it and be ready for it. So, so Jim, if, is- you've listened, oh. if you've ever listened to our podcast, we've, we've got like the, the, our two Venezuelan mafia guys talk about the Veralaques all the time. And that's what they're talking about is they just would get so excited. And, and, uh, that was something we had to really deal with, with Luis early on. And there's, there's a couple of things. I, there's two different things that, that I want to talk about. One, like if you want to feel that same kind of pressure is I tell these guys, look, 3d shoots are awesome, you know, but I, what I tell guys do is, I want you to go to a 3D shoot, get with the group that, man, these guys are really hot and get in there and just right, start talking crap like how friggin' great you are and you're going to smoke those dudes, man. Watch me, watch me. Are you ready for this? And I mean, just really put that pressure on yourself, you know, to, to feel that and to be able to take that. It's, it's, that's one way of doing that. The other thing that I look at is I hear guys and, and, and here's the situation. You'll hear this. What well, happened so fast? I didn't get a chance to get excited, get nervous. Right. Or there's just the opposite of the spectrum was it took so long for him to come in. I'm watching him the whole time that I was ready for it at that time. There seems to be like this, this kind of medium thing in there where they see the animal. It's not happening quick and they get to realize a few things and, and, everything starts to take over in their body, right? And what I've tried to tell people is, have you ever noticed those same exact people that after you have, let's say that you filled out a tag, and then you're out there with somebody else and you're calling, and now you have the biggest bull ever come in that you're calling, and you never get nervous, man. It's like you're watching this, and you're taking it in. You're looking, and you're going, how friggin' cool is this? And you're you're looking at parts of the animal. You're checking him out. You're watching how he's moving. You're watching his ears. You're learning about that animal. And so it's been two opposites. You know, when you put that self-imposed pressure on yourself ahead of time. Um, and, and I understand there's guys that want to make sure that they make an ethical clean kill. So they, they feel that kind of pressure. Again, that comes down to that confidence thing. But what I try to tell people is, is 
change your mode, man. Change your mode when that animal's coming in to the same way as if you've already tagged out. Use it as a learning moment. Look at how cool it is. You know, watch the animal. Look at how the animal's using its ears and its head. You know, start looking for your shooting lanes. Prep yourself, man, so that you've got this, this, and this. If he goes that way, this way, what's the wind doing? Where am I at with that? Is there anything else happening around? Looking for those twigs that are in places. You know, involve your mind because you're in the red zone and it takes you away from thinking about your own capabilities, man. Your capabilities are there. You prep for that. So what you have to do is you have to put yourself in the moment that you are there and give yourself those things. And and for some people, they have to have a checklist, man. They have to have a checklist of what they're doing. And when they have that procedure, it really makes them comfortable. Some people are really comfortable that way. And so if you're telling yourself, okay, animal, right? Shooting lanes, going right, going left. What am I ready for here? Do I need to move to a side? Am I going to have to slide over? What branches do I have in my way? Where's the wind at? Is he going to hit that? What if he circles downwind? So you just start solving those problems and it takes a lot of that other stuff and puts it in a different place. And then you're going to shoot that animal. And heck yeah, you're going to, then you're going to batise it, man. You're going to fall apart <laughs> all over the place, you know, and which is cool. I mean, that's what it's about. I mean, when you start Stop feeling that when you stop feeling that man inside here and what it's all about and what you've just accomplished, you, you might as well be done with it. Or, and and I've heard people say that, but at the same time, when you become that efficient killer, if it's about putting that food on the table and your job is to go put it in, you almost see it as a job instead of a recreation. You know, there is that level of that for some people, man, that, that they're able just to to see it as that, go get it done, do the process and, and move on, you know. Uh I don't know. Is that is that what you're looking for, guy? I'm looking for whatever answer. I mean, the biggest thing with all this, guys, <laughs> right, is is to have these different perspectives. But then we all fall in line from, you know, the guys that have been shooting, you know, 30 years to the guy that's been shooting four years. <laughs> Everybody's yeah. falling in line with with the same end result, time behind the bow, you know, confidence, things like that. And that's what my hope of this episode was, to be honest with all of you guys. Right. Is because there's so much information out there and where does a guy start or if you got somebody that's trying to increase their archery knowledge or increase their ability where do they start how do they pick it apart every one of you guys has done an excellent job in displaying your process through what you said so yes that was exactly the answer in my own long-winded version um i don't want to ignore mr jim huntsman so I love it caesar and i getting ready for season last year we're back at 70 80 yards shot breaks i'm like it's hitting that's a fucking dime right <laughs> that level of confidence when the shot breaks jim that's that's what i want you to talk about right because it's so important to know that you are hitting that mark you know screw a target screw the foam when that animal is in front of you that shot in my opinion i i am not squeezing this unless i know that that shot is going to hit that mark yeah yeah, no, you put it pretty good, man. I mean, I, I think that it's super situational. When when you're talking along those lines, I'll, I'll give you a really good example. When when I'm calling in an elk and I'm bugling and that elk is bugling and we're screaming in each other's face and there's all this adrenaline and we're focused on on that part of it that just makes my, you know, that's what makes my clock tick, right? And so I don't get shaky when I've got a bow drawn on a big screaming bull elk. I get shaky after the arrow flew. And then I'm then I'm like, oh man, I, I I can't believe I just went through that. Now you you take that situation and compare it to sitting in. Uh, I took my girls out uh, this last season to to sit. We sat in a deer stand, and uh, we're waiting for a whitetail to come in. And 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 I saw I I noticed the buck first, and then my girls saw the buck, and he's coming in. He's coming in real slow and cautious, and uh, I noticed myself. I'm getting a little bit shaky because there's. There's really nothing else to focus on. I don't have any control there. I'm waiting for the buck to come in, right? And so that that situation is uh, super dependent on what's going on around you and what you're focused on. You know, I was in the in the Marines. In 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 the Marines, they they're they're very big on your uh, ability to shoot and 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 going through the qualifying rounds to to become like a you know an expert rifleman. 
uh, and, and how you train on the range is totally different than how it actually shakes out in combat. You know, I was also in Iraq. And so, so the way that you shoot in combat is completely different than you're shooting on a range at Camp Lejeune or Camp Pendleton, California, right? And, and so that, that situational awareness and, and being focused on the, on the actual, uh, the, the mission and the target, um, I, I don't know if I'm explaining that right, but it, it is a, a situation that if, if you are one of those people that get really nervous as the shot is about to take place, I feel like you're not focusing enough on the mission part of it. And, and I don't mean to sound like, you know, in a militaristic uh, way, but the mission is you've got a screaming bull elk in front of you, man, focus on that thing. What do you got to do? Do I need to pull my bugle tube and scream over my left shoulder to bring him around some brush? Do I need to drop my bugle and draw? Do I need to, what, what do I need to do at this point? And, and that, that focus on what is going on around you is going to take your mind off of of the, the jitters that can come out of, like, you know, you, you felt like you just drank an espresso as you're drawing your bow, right? And, and that's going to take that off. Uh, if, if you're really focused on, on where you want to put that arrow and, and what you want the end result to be instead of, oh man, there is a 700 pound screaming horse with giant swords hanging off his head, uh, in front of me. You, you know what I mean? That's, I, I think the difference. Did that answer your question? Absolutely, man. It, 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 so we're into this two thirty, and we I could keep going. I'm I'm not on a time constraint, but I realize you guys got things, <laughs> so I'd like to just go around, uh, get a final comment from each of you guys, direct it however you will, and then for the gentlemen that have platforms, um, please drop those platforms so folks can uh, jump on and experience the good you guys are doing. So we'll start with Mr. Jilly. I'm gonna work from uh, left to right as I see it on the screen. So Mr. Jilly, if you could please. So you can find anything that we do on elkbros.com. And we have our podcast, which is Blue Collar Elk Hunting Podcast, um, which is <laughs> all kinds of free content. If you are somebody that uh, wants to pay for content, you can either find it through all of our podcasts or you can go to our Blue Collar Elk Academy and our base camp and you can purchase that and everything you've gotten 40 years of my knowledge uh inside that base camp the difference is on that is i do things just a little bit differently i i do it in my coaching style and my coaching methods that I've used with athletes, kids, uh, sports teams over the years and the way I do that. And it's very different from a lot of things that you're going to see out there. It's actually taking that pyramid where you build all that knowledge and you come up to the point of killing an elk and I flip it upside down. And I, I just have this uh, concept of, you know, all of us at one point in time, we can do everything wrong and we can end up with an elk in front of us. And it's like that dog chasing the car. You know, what are you going to do with it when you catch it? Right. So that's my process. And, and hopefully it's something that relates well to. So you can find that. You can find our podcast. You can find our YouTube videos. Just go to elkbros.com. Cool. Mr. Weaver. Uh, yeah. So on point podcast um, available wherever podcasts are available. Um, I self-titled my YouTube channel because I couldn't think of anything. So it's Garrett Weaver. Uh, super, super clever. Um, and yeah, so a lot of bow shooting tips, tricks, tactics, gear reviews, and the podcast covers a lot of what, you know, guys covers and, and I'm sure Jim and, and Joe's and, and Chad's and, you know, we all overlap some, some, little bit, but we all have different interviewing styles and, and we uh, all have different guests and stuff. So um, yeah, if, if you got some extra time to kill, check it out. And, and um, yeah, the, I'm, I'm ex extremely, uh, extremely available. I tell my wife that all the time. I'm extremely available. And um, if you, if you get a hold of me on uh, Instagram on point with Garrett Weaver, I usually am like pretty snappy at getting back to you. 
Um, and I, I literally, my, my title or my bio on the Instagram is, um, sharing my passion for bow hunting and helping people or people along the way. And I really do take that to heart. I try and help as many people as I can. Um, and seems to be direct messages seems to be the way that people choose to do that. So, um, yeah, I appreciate you guy for setting this up. You did a fantastic job hosting this thing, man. Very impressed. And, and uh, it was an honor to be able to share this room with everybody else here. Appreciate that, man. I appreciate the time. Mr. Riker. Yeah. So parting thought is we have hammered this home, I think, throughout this podcast and it's spent time with your equipment, especially archery. Obviously, we've been talking a lot about archery. I preach it a lot on the podcast where I just say, I don't care what it is, if it's a new piece of gadget technology, mapping software, uh, th- the SOS button, the Garmin in reach, just understand how to use everything that's going with you out to the woods. And I'll circle that back to the, when do you know that you're prepared? Cause that to me, that just knowing how to use whatever it is that you're going to use when you go to the, to the mountain is, is going to make you as prepared as you're going to be right. You can only be so prepared. Um, practice, practice, practice. Uh, we're back country rookies anywhere you want to try to find us. We got a terrible YouTube channel, an okay <laughs> podcast, <laughs> trashy website. We're out there, man. <laughs> We're out there. Come yeah, and find right. us. So um, I appreciate I love your show, man. I love your show. Yeah. I, well, man, I can't say enough good things about everything that everybody on here is doing too. So um, appreciate you having me. Appreciate everybody's time. Absolutely. Man. Uh, Mr. Caesar. Uh, well, first, I'd like to thank Guy for having me on the podcast. I definitely feel like I've uh, taken away a lot from all of everyone's experience here because, uh, you know, I've been pretty quiet because I've been listening. And that's, you know, uh, the other thing that uh, I'd like to say is um, I think that, yeah, like, I mean, at the end of the day, it's all about practice. And, and you know, I'm still very, very new uh, but I hope to learn more in the woods. And at the end of the day, like it's time behind the bow and it's time in the woods. And that's what my takeaway has been in general, hanging with guy and being here with you all and just, you know, following all the platforms I follow. So, um, yeah, I'd like to thank guy again. Thanks for having me. You know, thank you for having me on the podcast, number one, but thank you for also, in some ways, you know, taking me under your wings and, uh, I'm grateful for that. So I hope to, to talk to every one of y'all, uh, again at some point. And, uh, yeah, we hope, we hope I'll be sending them guys pictures, man, with, uh, with an elk <laughs> this you year. Come up to Oregon him. and shoot That's a bear. Right. We got too damn many of them. So <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to, hell yeah, let's do it. <laughs> Michael. Yeah. <laughs> You know, first off, I, I mean, the panel that you, you've put together here, this is incredible. The resources that people have just right here and in the resources that are available to them, you know, take advantage of those resources. Um, in fact, I kind of need to practice what I, 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 I preach sometimes about taking advantage of that. So, yeah. Yeah, I'd like to order a dozen arrows, please. Never mind. Is this Garrett? Is this Garrett Weaver? Is this Garrett Weaver? <laughs> oh, that's good. So, oh, that's man. great. <laughs> <laughs> the resources that are here and the resources that are available to people that can help them shorten the learning curve. And um, I mean, I admire and respect each and every one of you and, and love what you guys are doing to pay it forward and give back. So uh, as far as my platform is outcallingacademy.com, it's that same thing, outcallingacademy.com on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok. Yeah. You got a TikTok? <laughs> You're on TikTok? I, you know, I, mean, I was debating whether I was going to be out there. Or, <laughs> I mean, was I going to throw TikTok or was I going to throw the fans only? I mean, I mean which route was I going to go here? Oh. So, that one, I'm not surprised. <laughs> yeah, and then, oh, my gosh. Academy.com. We, uh, over at ElkCallingAcademy.com, we got that mastermind group <laughs> that uh, has, you know, kind of take the lessons and everything from the 30 plus years that, 
of mistakes that I've made out in the, out in the woods and just kind of give that to the mastermind group. Every two weeks we do live Q and A's just for that mastermind group. And uh, just switched over to a new live stream platform. In fact, I reached out to guy and, and I have that ability now to bring, you know, guys such as yourselves in and you can remote in on this live stream right from where you're at and just kind of share experiences and journey and, and, and that kind of fun stuff. But guy, you know, is always extremely humble to be a part of this and, and to receive the invite and, and thanks for having me. Absolutely, brother. Appreciate it. Kyle. Yeah. So uh, again, guy, thanks for pulling everybody together. It's a fun crew, man. And it just re- you know, reaffirms everything that, you know, hunting people are good people. Like there's no joke about it. I didn't know a few of the guys that are on here and, you know, I've been more than impressed. I've learned a lot and they're just good guys. And there's something to be said for that. Just in general, just being a good person is a, is a good, good skill to have. Um, I try to instill that in my kids, but, uh, yeah, thanks for having us on. It's good to see some of the old friends and make new ones. Um, DCA Customeros, uh, I got the website and, uh, <laughs> I got a website, Instagram, Facebook, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, Can you I'm see working. the website a little slower, Kyle? Because it just flowed together for me. What is yeah. that? DCA Custom Arrows. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, DCA Custom Arrows, uh, <laughs> dot com, And then uh, Instagram, DCA Custom Arrows. Uh, you can see a lot of the stuff on there. All the stuff that I post on there, all the, you know, how the wraps look. And they all look. I'm not an artist, but you know, I, I kind of get it lucky sometimes. And, but the main thing that I focus on is the math and I, I just love doing that. So I have a bunch of new products that are going to be coming out this year. Uh, some that already did. So I got some, uh, points that I've done. Uh, they're called subsonic, but, uh, and they're, they're aerodynamic and all that stuff. But the other nice thing is they're rounded. So you can't poke yourself with them. You can't rip veins off or anything with them. Uh, but I'll have other stuff. The veins are coming out. Uh, and I'll keep all that stuff up to date on Instagram. Um, I'm behind on emails. Uh, I have two full-time jobs right now. Plus I'm a dad and a husband and everything. So life's a balance, uh, but I'm way behind on emails. Uh, I apologize to everybody that that's submitted some, but uh, you know, it's, it's a good community. And uh, I think like everybody said, practice, 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 that'll get you better. And uh, everybody should be nice to each other, man. And it, you, because you didn't bring it up. So Kyle has a VAT, right? It's a vein alignment tool. Oh, and yeah. uh, that thing has been money for me building my veins and, and testing different offsets. Um, oh. So it's, it's worth every uh, bit of the $10. That was a great idea. Yeah. 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 So this is it. So this allows you to align your bits and burger jig so that you can get my hat in there too. <laughs> so you can uh, you get it exactly right. And, you know, you can get anything on here. Uh, on a bits, you'll probably get, you know, five, five and a half degrees. Uh, I'll tell everybody that I fletch everything at two and a half degrees. That's where I found with my testing that it, you get optimal performance, no parachuting, good grouping, you know, no wondering, uh, that kind of stuff. But yeah, the, the vein angle tool is cool. Uh, it's all, all the stuff's available on my website now. Um, and anything you guys do, uh, you know, it keeps me going and it keeps me working on products that are coming out. And, you know, I, People ask me all the time, do people care about veins? You know, why do you have a wind tunnel? That seems stupid. It's just an arrow. Great. I don't care. I love it. And uh, if anybody can benefit from, benefit from it, then that's great. Uh, I do it for my own uh, kind of curiosity to be personal about it. But like, you know, uh, there's people out there that like to do this stuff. And there's people out there that kind of dig what I do. So I appreciate all those people. Heck yeah. Awesome. Huh? Mr. Huntsman. Uh, Michael, do you want to talk about your hat situation that you got going on? <laughs> he, he thought it was a decoy show. <laughs> yeah, you weren't here earlier. It's it's Jim. It's the it's, it's the hearing enhancer five thousand. <laughs> I my goodness, he's got man. a video for it on his TikTok channel. I I, <laughs> that was, that I don't want to see on that TikTok. one. That's weird. That one's over on the Facebook. <laughs> So yeah, yeah, I don't know if there's there's a pants version and a no pants. I, I challenge you to kill an elk with that on your head this year. Yeah, I would challenge you. I like Garrett's idea, man. I mean, wearing your depends on the wrong side of your body. <laughs> <laughs> you hear something over there? No, I uh, 
<laughs> yeah, no, I appreciate you having me on there, guy. This is uh, this has been a lot of fun, and and uh, everybody on here. Uh, I mean, Caesar, it was great to meet you. Uh, you 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 guys, I just I some of you I haven't met. Uh, Garrett, I'd love to get you on my show to talk Likewise. about the wood, woodsmanship thing because my my podcast, the Western Huntsman podcast, is kind of focused on on that aspect of it. Like uh, we we've we've talked a lot of gear and 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 things along those lines that I'm not super technical about, but but where my show focuses is on that kind of thing. The woodsmanship, how to, how to read a mountain, how to, how to get in front of a bull elk and how to locate elk and how to locate deer and, 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 and these things. We talk about everything from, uh, you know, mountain public land whitetails to how to wrap uh, vanilla ice songs. <laughs> you, you know, we, we do a little bit of everything. So did you write um, a song for this? You didn't. Have, you don't have a song ready I, I, for it. You know, I didn't. I, I I wasn't sure how how that would roll out, but I, I thought about making one guy <laughs> just for you, and and I I didn't do it. I they, didn't do it. This they time. are the most atrocious things I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> but hot damn, if I gotta listen to them a couple times without laughing to hear everything he says. <laughs> I could send you the raw cut version, buddy. Don't you worry. <laughs> don't, don't, don't worry about that. <laughs> I heard that Where's voice. The <laughs> <laughs> I like the hard limiter as no, it's coming through that. my speakers. <laughs> <laughs> So my rap debut, uh, as far as guy is concerned, it didn't go too well. <laughs> I thought it was awesome, man. I, was, I was there. I was with you. Uh, we were. <laughs> <laughs> No, we, we do do a lot of, uh, you know, we try to stick uh, to the the humorous side of things on 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 my show, but uh, you know, there's also a lot of serious stuff. But uh, we don't get too serious, you know, and that's okay. So you can you can find us on uh, Instagram at uh, at the Western Huntsman, and uh, the Western Huntsman is not like my nickname. It's just a, it's it's a brand where where we all those of us that hunt the West, we can we can go. And we can we can communicate and talk about things like conservation and wildlife management and and uh, and things along those nature or along that line. Um, and uh, I sure appreciate you having me on. And if you guys want to learn how to hunt elk, um, I learned to hunt elk through the Elk Bros and the Elk Calling Academy with these two guys on there. Uh, they may be old, but they know what they're talking about. <laughs> And I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, I knew that. That's how I read them sooner or later about the age thing. <laughs> well, look, I, I'll throw another up. plug out there. If you have not gone and listened on Western Contours to the uh, Wapiti Wednesdays that Michael had done back yeah. there, you've you've missed out on a lot of incredible content too. So, uh, yeah, check those yeah. out. So, yeah, gentlemen, sure. there's a reason I asked all of you. I, I have an admiration and respect for how you guys present hunting, not just to our community, but to the world. Right. And I and I absolutely appreciate each and every one of you and your platforms. Thank you for the time tonight. Um, from the bottom of my heart, I, I really do appreciate it. Respect the hell out of all you gentlemen. Um, I'll let you get back to your families. We're almost three hours deep. I can keep going, but thank you guys. It's, it's been a good time. Yeah, thanks, and I guy. think the message thank came through loud and clear. Thank you guys. All appreciate right, boys. It. You guys have a great one. We'll see you. All right, guys, that's this episode of the podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you, Guy, from Western Contours Podcast for hosting this thing and definitely going to be getting a hold of some of these other guys on the podcast. Uh, Jim, Joe, Chad, uh, Mike might come back on to mine. You know, we're, all, we're all talking now, and I just think it was a great podcast with, filled with a bunch of guys and a ton of experience. So hopefully you guys got something out of it. If you ever have a question or you want a concern or your suggestion for a podcast episode you can always email me at garrettweaverhunts at gmail.com and i will answer your email take your suggestions or you can leave me a review communicate me through a review or just get a hold of me on instagram i'm very very reachable and always try and get back to you as soon as i can so outside of that guys appreciate you for listening and i'll see you on the next one